live avergato i'd like to take the privilege to thank everybody for joining us uh, on uh, on the weekend for this event today uh, prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said ilm hasil karo pa tumhe iske liye cheen jana pade so thanks to the digital world that we are able to be have uh, having a teaching session at the comfort of our sofa and be able to share screens and knowledge and wisdom across the globe and thanks to team impact for launching this event today and the, just a quick note about impact it's a uk non profit organization of expatriate pakistanis comprising of international team of experts in healthcare and allied professionals we have successfully launched a series of online sessions dealing with various aspects of covid-19 for healthcare professionals in pakistan with an underlying uh, mission to facilitate medical staff with the most up to date and evidence based information during this pandemic to our homeland i would like to offer special thanks to chief minister sin sayed murad ali shah dr azra fazal minister of health of sin health department government of balochistan vice chancellors of most medical universities of pakistan and all public sector medical colleges and hospitals uh we've got two excellent speakers over here who are well achieved and well versed uh, and we proudly present to you two dawites uh, from uh, dawa medical college uh, karachi uh, one is a radiologist one is a critical care specialist and we i'm going to pass on the presentation first of all to dr rahat hussain who is a critical care consultant uh, uh, in america uh, he's is also the associate professor and medical director and an ecmo specialist and we hope that he'll share uh, uh his presentation now with all of us over to you dr rahat hussain thank you very much um thank you very much for actually inviting me to talk um i'm really privileged and uh i thank to the whole impact team that this is a really amazing effort that you guys are doing um just a little bit about me i um uh, graduated from dow medical college from 2001 um have been practicing in Houston Texas uh in the Texas Medical Center that is the uh, largest center in the world a medical center and uh, I am at uh, University of Texas uh and have been here for the last 7 uh, to 8 years uh, I specialize in lung transplant um ICU and also in pulmonary medicine I also do a thing called ECMO which I will be talking about today briefly and also take care of covid-19 patients every day so i thought this is a very good timing for me to um share my knowledge with all my fellow citizens back home so again i thank you very much bahut bahut shukriya aap logon ka mujhe involve karne ka aur mujhe invite karne ka is uh, uh, platform pe so without further ado main start karna chahunga apni presentation ko um and i'll uh, try to speak in english and uh, if uh, um there are requests i can switch um or mix and match with whichever you guys are comfortable with uh, just please let me know this is for everyone who's listening and i would like uh, this time to be your um like to the best possible way so thank you very much it's a very common thing that you do um in american zoom meetings so please mute yourself if you are uh, just joining in uh because we um will be listening to your background noises if you don't have your uh, mute button on so as soon as you join in please mute yourself thank you very much um so covid-19 uh, pandemic is one of the worst pandemics after the spanish flu and uh this has uh, taken the world by surprise in ways that we have not realized i'm going to be talking about the etiology the timeline incidence prevalence clinical presentation um a little bit diagnosis but the main diagnosis would be uh, later on in the presentation with dr ahmed and he will be talking about radiological uh, manifestations of the disease i will also touch base on some of the uh, pre uh, acute presentations in the icu uh, that will be neurologic presentations cardiac uh, hematologic and gi presentations in addition to that i will be uh, touching base with the oxygen therapies that we have available right now some of the things that help with the patients who are on the ventilator and then i will also talk about ecmo and supportive care um and the ethics of um how long uh, should be continued the ventilator um should ecmo be provided to everyone or not 
So the next uh, slide um, talks about what is coronavirus. Coronavirus is uh, basically a kind of a beta coronavirus that started uh, in China. Can you please mute? Coronavirus is a, a beta coronavirus uh, that has four groups. Among those four groups, uh, there were two viruses in the last two decades that have uh, affected us. It is a zoonotic uh, virus, which means it originates from the animals. And uh, affects oh. The main thing about this virus is that there are two incidents uh, in the in in the last uh... hello okay sorry um, so as soon as people will be joining in and if they are not muted, I will tell them to do that um, so that uh, there's not a lot of uh, a delay if if that's okay with you guys Dr. Rajasen. What I'm trying to do is, as soon as people are entering, I'm muting all and then unmuting you. It's uh, because people are coming in bulk. So I don't know okay. if you want to keep, if you want me to let you keep running the presentation and you can ask people to mute, that's fine by me as well. Okay, we'll see. We can do whatever we want. To Dr. Ram, I would advise, you know, if you mute all yourself, that will be really helpful. If your know, host will do it, it will mute yourself as well. Sure, I can mute, mute myself. Okay. So mute, mute all. Yeah. Okay. So um, there are two incidences where uh, the, cor the coronavirus actually has crossed over from the zoonotics, from the animals into the humans in the last uh, two decades. In 2002 and 2004, the SARS virus, which is basically the uh, ARDS or respiratory uh, virus who, that broke out and killed about 1,000 people and uh, infected 8,000 people. And the other one was the MERS virus, if you remember that, it actually originated from uh, Saudi Arabia and it had a mortality rate of about 34%, which was very, very virulent. Um, so these are the two viruses that we know of that actually have crossed over for, from zoonotics and this is the third virus that has done that. Um, it uses a thing called the ACE inhibitor receptor, as you can see on the right side of the screen, um, that this receptor combines with the glycoprotein over here and then causes the human cell to get infected. These ACE2 receptors are basically present in the arteries, in the smooth muscles, the rest of the epithelial muscles, and different immune system cells as well. So it basically affects your whole body. Uh, the main thing about the coronavirus that is uh, very concerning is the timeline. The timeline basically started in December uh, 31st when the first time the Chinese um, alerted the WHO that there is a zoonotic like a MERS and a SARS uh, in the past, and it has crossed over. And they saw a respiratory distress patient um, who basically did not make it uh, first, uh, in, in the first week of January. And then throughout the time, it, it kept on increasing to a point where Egypt confirmed its first case in, on February 14th. And lo and behold, uh, we were the last people to get affected. And uh, in the United States, as you can see, the first case in Houston in my city uh, came in, in March, on March the 4th. This was uh, from a person who uh, was traveling on a cruise ship to Egypt. And uh, those are the people, uh, they basically were the first people to bring this on. Um, there were 199 cases in Houston and then two deaths. These were, uh, the deaths were increasing exponentially. And then June 19th, if you see that right now, we have about eight, 0.6 million cases in the United States at, throughout the world and about half a million deaths so far. Uh, out of that, 2 million people are affected in the United States. So we by far have the most amount of cases that are affected in the, in the United States. I got this yesterday from uh, the World Meter and the John Hopkins website. And this is how much Pakistan is being affected. As you can see, Pakistan got, uh, got its first case somewhere around in March where when we got affected in New York, 
and it slowly had cr crept up. And when in May, you guys have seen a complete spike of this uh, uh, coronavirus, which is basically causing you to have significant amount of uh, um, distress, as I can imagine there. The death toll, as you can see, has significantly gone up as well. And at the same time, the case fatality rate is almost the same, if not more, than in, than in uh, America. This is the age distribution. This was a really good JAMA study that came out in the last uh, month that showed that they looked at 44,000 patients and they looked at the age distribution. As you can see, the, we, what we say that this is the disease of the old or all the elderly, which probably is not a completely accurate statement. Look at the disease. It, about from age 30 to 79, about 87% of the people are getting affected. The spectrum of the disease is significantly severe in these patients who are younger, in these patients who actually have a very robust immune system. So to say that people who have low immune system and people who are actually immunocompromised or older are the only people who are getting infected is basically not true. The case fatality rate is still, to this day, throughout the world is about 2.4, 2.5%. Uh, Italy has seen as high as 14% case fatality rate, which is one of the highest in the whole world. Um, <clears throat> Pakistan, um, I will show you in the next uh, couple of slides, is uh, right up there at around 3%. Now, what about the symptoms of COVID-19? COVID-19, uh, it is, as you know, is a, is a virus that usually happens with the respiratory uh, symptoms. Um, it, it affects your lungs, it affects uh, your nasopharynx, and the symptoms usually start at day eight of the illness. There's a thing called the incubation period, which is about three to four days. After three to four days, you start feeling the symptoms of shortness of breath, cough, fever, chills. About 20% of the times, you may end up getting into the hospital. And so the hospitalized patients in the, that need ICU are about five to 10%. So, in general, I'll go over this slide again <clears throat> in another uh, format. Um, but about 15% of the patients end up in the ICU, uh, end up in the hospital. And out of those 15%, 20% get, end up into the um, ICUs. So COVID-19 uh, clinical presentation, if you see on the right side, um, has about 77 to 98% fever. That's a very common symptom. It's like a viral illness, as you all know. Um, cough myalgias, fatigue, shortness of breath. These are the predominant symptoms. When they looked at about 1,099 patients, fever was present in about 44% of the patients. So sometimes you may not even have a fever and you can have this disease. Olfactory, um, you might have listened, okay, um, I cannot smell or ca I cannot taste. The olfactory nerves actually, because the virus gets into the nasopharynx more so strongly, is about, in a Chinese study, about close to 48%. Um, as high as 98%, um, there are certain cases that have been reported. So lack of taste, lack of smell is one of the problems. Diarrhea is one of the problems that you need to look for. Um, one of the things I really want to tell you guys is that, that please be aware that this is a pandemic. A pandemic means that every other person is going to get infected or so, about one third of the population will get infected. So you really have to have your, um, what we call pretest probability very, very high if you have any sort of symptoms that I'm describing right now and get yourself checked because the importance of getting yourself checked is extremely crucial. Um, otherwise you may have significant problems. <clears throat> the next thing I would like to tell you is uh, the amount of infectivity that you have. Um, as you can see, about 30% of people who will get infected will have no symptoms. You will be just fine, and, but you still will have the virus. So when we say that asymptomatic people can be spreading the virus, that's what we mean. If you see the top of the slide, 30% will have no symptoms. 55% will have mild to moderate symptoms, which means that about 80% of the people will be sort of mild or asymptomatic carriers. This is extremely dangerous because you don't even know that you have the disease and you are walking with it. 
without the face mask, without washing your hands, if you're doing that, you're not only infecting others, but people around you are probably getting much sicker and you have no idea which one is in the 20% range and which one is the 80% range. <clears throat> now, 20% of these people, as you can see on the, on the bottom two uh, bars, will get affected with severe symptoms and will get hospitalized. 15% of them that will get hospitalized will die. And out of those 5% that will end up in the ICUs, half of them will die. This is a staggering number. And we have to be aware of that. And that's why we need to take precaution. If one thing you guys can learn from this lecture is prevention. So far, I do not claim to be an expert on this disease at all. There is a, a paucity of data. There is no data that is confirmly showing that the, we are, have uh, taken care of this disease. But what is extremely that we have shown that uh, is important is prevention. If we are able to prevent this disease from spreading, we can actually save lives. And so that is, would, would be the motto of this uh, whole lecture, if, if I may say that. This is the vital response. The vital response phase, uh, the virus comes in, in three phases. The first phase is the early phase that we talked about. Five days, there are no symptoms, even if you're infected or it's severe disease, you, nobody knows which those patients are. So the five days in early infection turns into pulmonary phase. When the pulmonary phase starts, then the body starts reacting with its host inflammatory response systems. A huge surge, of uh, significant uh, uh, cytokines, T lymphocytes, interleukins, TNF alphas. It basically keeps on growing and growing uh, up to a point that the body's immune system actually affects, starts affecting uh, us. And then we enter into a stage called the hyperinflation phase. And once we enter in that phase, that's where we are extremely uh, susceptible to infections. That's where we are having significant problems with shortness of breath. That's when we are having significant pneumonia. We end up in the ICU and death and so on and so forth. So, so this is the most important uh, thing that you, you guys would like to know that we have to stop this in the first phase or not even enter that phase. Um, one thing I wanted to just compare is the case fatality rate of uh, COVID-19. COVID as you can see the arrows, the first arrow is showing 3% fatality rate of the disease that you are having right now, the, uh, the SARS-CoV-2019. Uh, H1N1 of 1918 is the Spanish flu. Its case fatality rate is also 3%. And unfortunately, the Spanish flu of 1918 killed close to 50 million people around the world. It affected one third of the world's population because people did not have all these uh, things that we have right now. They did not take equal precautions. So what we have in hand right now with this uh, coronavirus 2019 is, can be as bad as the Spanish flu of the 1919 that killed 50 million people in the world. That is a staggering number that we really need to understand. Uh, that's why I place this uh, thing right now. As I told you before, uh, Italy mortality is about 12 to 14 percent. This is the highest mortality that we have seen. And then um, Iran's mortality was higher as well. And Pakistan, as you can see over here, has significant mortality that is ranging up to 2.5 to 2.7 percent right now. So that's why we are having this talk and we really need to understand what this disease is and how we can actually um, help that. Um, in addition to that, the other things that I'm going to talk about is uh, I'm, going to, I'm not going to go in detail about the diagnostic testing because uh, this is going to be a, a problem. Uh, it's a whole lecture by itself. But there are certain things that you want to look for in the lab data. Number one is leukopenia. People who are very, very sick 25%, one fourth of them are presenting with severely low white blood cell count and lymphopenia and their leukocyte count and their lymphocytes are significantly low. Then neutrophils may be normal or high. And that's where we calculate a thing called the uh, neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, 
Um, but that's something that we have to uh, talk about sometime later on. And then obviously um, we talked about testing. A uh, few things about testing, you guys can read this slide. I, it's a busy slide. I don't want to uh, delay uh, too much on this because I'm going to talk about management in detail. Uh, the SARS uh, virus or this uh, coronavirus uh, that we are dealing with, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, has um, significant um, PCR or these RNAs uh, we can, that re replicate. And we can actually check those uh, test, uh, testing by a thing called the reverse trans, uh, transcriptase and PCR, where we see the replication of the RNA that's happening. It's a very sensitive test. I think you guys have that too in, in Pakistan. And uh, the, the viral replication actually occurs really, really fast. So you guys can detect the testing um, within one, two, maybe four days. I'm not sure what the time frame over there is. Um, but here we can actually get it in, uh, get test results in uh, five minutes, 15 minutes to all the way to two or four days. Um, the other thing to note, which is very important because I have the ear of all the healthcare workers, is number one, the nasopharyngeal swabs, they are not perfect. About 75 to 80% of the times you can get a positive result, but about 20 to 25% of the time you may not be positive even if you have the disease or if you have the virus. Um, so just please, if you are, your symptoms are high, like you're having the vital prodome-like symptoms, and yet you are negative, that means that uh, you got to get yourself checked again, because 25% chance that you are missing. Um, so get yourself checked the second time. The other thing that is uh, what we have found out in our experience, that the nasopharyngeal swab is less sensitive as compared to the tracheal aspirate. For example, if a patient gets intubated, and has a breathing tube in his nose, uh, you can get an aspiration of his trachea and send that. That is more sensitive as compared to a patient who does not have that. So these are a few things that you really need to know about the nasopharyngeal swab. So please do not rely on them. So if it is negative and if you have the symptoms, please make sure you go and get the, yourself checked again in two days or so again. Now, uh, I'm not gonna talk in detail about uh, radiology because Dr. Ahmed is going to talk about that, but ground glass opacities are what we are seeing on the CT scans, which are mostly in peripheral. Uh, that's how they are starting and getting into consolidations. <clears throat> what I'm gonna sh wanna share is that I wanna talk about uh, a case of mine. This is one of my patients who I saw in the ICU. Uh, this was a young 35 year old guy uh, with only history of high blood pressure. He was on, not even on medications and had diabetes type two, his hemoglobin A1C is 7.5, and is a little bit big and has BMI is 40. BMI stands for body mass index. You calculate it from your height and from your weight, um, as you may know. He presents to us with a five-day history of fever, chills, and cough, and some shortness of breath along with diarrhea. Um, when he presented to us, he was very short of breath. His blood pressure was 107 or 73. He was uh, really tachycardic um, <clears throat> with a heart rate of 115. His oxygen saturations were only 76%, and he was having a fever of 102.9. Um, despite us giving him oxygen from a nasal cannula, from a non rebreather mask, his uh, uh, saturations did not improve that well, and he was only at uh, 89%. When we got to his labs, white count was eight, platelet counts were normal, BNP is a natriotic peptide. We usually get this uh, to see if the patient has any significant uh, um, heart problems or not, but he did not have that positive. His troponins were negative, and so we thought that this patient uh, really uh, did not have any heart problems. He looked like he had uh, COVID-19. His chest x-ray uh, showed bilateral infiltrates, and his CT scan was done because he was a young guy. He was a little bit big. We were wanting to make sure he did not have pulmonary embolism. Um, because these patients do present with clots in the lungs as well called pulmonary embolism. His PCR later on in the ER came back positive. This is his chest x-ray. Um, he had, as you can see, bilateral alveolar infiltrates, both sides. Um, he's got, these are peripherally dominant um, and uh, he was looking really, really ill and he was admitted to the ICU. Um, we, now I'm gonna talk about his management and I'm gonna talk about the data. Uh, along with his management. So 
the medical management uh, included on, on this guy, as soon as we did, obviously we gave him oxygen and I'm gonna talk about that later on, but we also started some antiviral therapies, inflammatory modulators. Um, <clears throat> before I go into details about the um, medications, um, these are the medications that are uh, approved and uh, we use them here in the United States. Remdesivir is one of them. As you can see, I'm gonna just quickly go over this cartoon. Uh, the virus is right here. Uh, as you can see, number one, it uses the ACE2 inhibitor, which is on top of the cell, and then it gets into the cell, and then a we, um, from here, gets uh, into the cell and get into the uh, viral replication phase. And when it does that, the uh, two things that stop the replication and the signaling is number one, hydroxychloroquine, which you see in uh, number four, and also you see number three, that remdesivir and hydroxychloroquine stop the signaling of the RNA. And uh, um, when it does that, when the viral starts replicating inside a person's cell, then the cell gives signals to uh, the T cell. On top of your screen, you would see T cell. The T cell uses uh, cytokines and the on interleukin-6 to activate the immune system. So when the cyto interleukin-6 is in a very high amount, right. IL-6 is released. Um, and uh, we are going, we, the tocolosumab is uh, one of those medications that we use. Um, so this patient of mine um, got admitted to the ICU. His oxygen requirement was very high. Um, we evaluated him and started him on remdesivir. Uh, most recent data on remdesivir, as you can see on this the screen, is, it came out from a New England Journal study <clears throat> that showed that uh, the uh, patients were uh, randomized in a double-blinded trial <clears throat> they were every patient who was hospitalized um, and was most of these patients were on high amount of oxygen were given 200 milligrams of remdesivir followed by 100 milligrams of uh, remdesivir IV daily for an additional nine days, a total of 10 days. And this is a pretty big population. 1,059 patients were um, uh, looked at. Half of half, uh, half got the placebo and half got the remdesivir. Uh, what they did find that although the, uh, there was no significant difference in mortality um, statistically, but if you take a look at absolute numbers, there was a 7% with remdesivir and 11.9% with placebo. Um, and as you can see on the right of your screen, I have pushed in placebo and uh, remdesivir results. And we see that the survival was better, the viral replication was better, and the patients uh, did get out of the ICU uh, a little bit faster than the placebo group. So that's one of the medications that we are using these days right now. And our patient who is the young 35 year old I showed you um, got this medication. The other drug I wanted to touch briefly is hydroxychloroquine. I know everyone um, got really, really excited about this drug initially, but this drug has not shown any significant benefit. Um, just to give you a one liner. Um, we have been there, what I have showed you in the first cartoon, if I go back um, quickly, um, there the, uh, hydro, um, the hydroxychloroquine has a few beneficial effects. It's an anti-inflammatory. It uh, releases the, uh, it actually stops the release of the virus into the host cells. So the replication and the immune system that actually can get ramped up does not get ramped up very, very, very fast. And it also reduces the viral infectivity. And uh, it's an immune modulator, just like your azithromycin is. Um, but we have had now plenty of data, the <clears throat> BMJ article, New England Journal article that was recently retracted, as you know, um, uh, showed, clearly showed that hydroxychloroquine did not have very clear benefit. Uh, <clears throat> so we're not using that. This patient did not get remdesivir. Um, the other drug I wanted to mention is lopinavir and ritonavir. Um, this is one of the medications that we are using for HIV, uh, if uh, some of you know that. Um, we, um, recent trials in the New England Journal uh, that came out last month, uh, a very nice study uh, that was done in a one-to-one -one format, randomized control. It was not a double-blinded placebo trial. Intention to treat analysis was there. Um, the mortality at 28 days was similar in the lopinavir group versus the standard group. As you can see um, on the third point on the left side, that about 19.2% mortality difference versus 25%. Uh, <clears throat> the confidence interval was very big because the patients were not uh, in a huge amount. 
Um, so this is one of the medications that we consider, but we do not give on a regular basis. It's only in patients um, in, who are admitted to the ICU, we even think about it. Um, and this is one of the medications that um, has to be talked about with multiple people, uh, including HIV experts, including infectious disease, pulmonary and ICU doctors. We all make a decision in combination whether the patient needs it or does not need it. Uh, but as a standard uh, therapy, we are not using uh, uh, this combination right now. Now, tocolosumab. Um, I know that in Pakistan, uh, people were very excited. One of my friends told me that people went in and got a lot of tocolosumab and uh, <clears throat> the injections are being sold um, at a ridiculously high price and stuff like that. So this data on IL-6 inhibitors, which is tocolosumab, is not very, very clear. There was some indication in the initial phases that tocolosumab is going to be beneficial. But so far, all the studies that have come out actually have shown that this IL-6 inhibitor can uh, also reduce the inflammatory markers, but it will not be able to help the patients, especially if they are at home, especially if they have less symptoms, especially if they are the people who are, um, you know, only um, have mild symptoms with nasal drainage and fatigue. Tocolizumab, if we are even thinking about it, we get IL-6 levels, and if the IL-6 levels are super high, and the patient is not doing well, only in that scenario, we are trying to give that. I have used tocolizumab in some of my patients and I have had complications with those patients. Uh, as you know, tocolizumab de decreases the immune system very, very, very aggressively. And when it does that, all the patients that I have treated with tocolizumab have developed secondary pneumonias. So one, you have coronavirus. On top of that, if you, people who have received tocolizumab are getting superbugs like pseudomonas, like staphylococcus aureus, like stenotrophomonas, and their outcomes are not really, really good. Anyway, so our patient that we are talking about did not receive that medication um, after we considered. Now, steroids. The steroids, as you know, uh, I'm going to quickly pass this because this is for uh, tocolizumab. I don't want to go into detail about that. <clears throat> Now, steroids, as you know, just came out last week, right? There was a big trial and uh, people were very excited about it. And uh, one of my friends actually told me that people are buying dexamethasone and they're hoarding and, and keeping them at your house. Please do not do that. Uh, the trial that I'm going to go over with you is from the recovery group. Um, and the details of that is not uh, come out yet. Um, there are indications to use steroids in patients with pneumonia or severe pneumonia with coronavirus and COVID-19, but not every patient is going to benefit from steroids or dexamethasone. Um, this is the, all the trials since, since the coronavirus has started. I found four or five trials that were published with, with steroids. The number one was the FANG trial. They are all Chinese studies. Um, one of the trials on the right side, if you see this, uh, uh, my, um, I'm just gonna do this here. Uh, one of the, only one of the, the right side, uh, second graph that shows that there is a difference between a mortality when you start steroids early. So the problem with steroids is twofold. <clears throat> Number one, if you start steroids early in the phase where you are not infected, like between day zero and day five, then you can actually cause the virus to get replicated faster. And that is going to be bad for you so don't do that. Uh, when they looked at the recovery trial, and I'm going to go over this here, um, this was a very well done study, um, and the details of it has not come out yet. The two populations that actually got benefit from steroids are the people who were number one intubated on the ventilator, and number two, the people who were on a high amount of oxygen. Yes, people who were intubated, as you can see, had a reduction in mortality of about 20% which is great, but when they were used in patients who had mild respiratory symptoms, there was no benefit. And as a matter of fact, you may, cause, you may be causing harm if you're using steroids at that time. So steroids have benefits, but in very specific population in the ICU or patients who are getting worse and not when you are in viral replication phase because you may hurt yourself using that. Um, then I'm going to quickly go over the management, uh, neurological management um, of my patient. Um, so 
So far, let, let me summarize. Our young 35-year-old guy who came in with diabetes, hypertension, and COVID positive is in the ICU. He got remdesivir. Uh, so we did give him steroids because he was in the ICU on high amount of oxygen and he was getting worse. Um, we also looked for other signs uh, of problems. COVID-19 presents with hemorrhagic necrotizing encephalopathy uh, when you basically have brain bleeds in the thalamus. And it has been reported um, in uh, multiple trials. As you can see, this uh, patient who came in had, was young, had no comorbidities. And she was in her late uh, 50s, and she was presented to have this kind of a presentation. Um, so she was started on therapy, but unfortunately did not uh, make it. Um, one of the important things that uh, SARS uh, or coronavirus does present, and that's why we get an echocardiogram, is myocarditis. My patient, the 35-year-old guy, got an echocardiogram, did not have myocarditis. The other things that you want to look for um, uh, is, number one, you want to look for if the EKG changes. Number two, you want to look for a troponin leak. Number three, you want to look for any signs of BNP, natriotic peptide elevation, if the patient is having severe shortness of breath, because that can fool you. Um, so there are actually 12 to 15% of the time you can have patients on SARS-CoV-2 that can present with myocarditis and no respiratory symptoms altogether. So please don't miss that. If your patient is presenting with chest pain, um, look for these things. Another thing that's actually very important uh, that came out in um, Lancet uh, about two months ago is that uh, patients who are um, in this COVID-19, because there's a lockdown, there is actually complete uh, missing of the STEMI. People uh, don't see STEMI anymore, which is very, very weird. Um, so that's one of the things that you want to look for. These people uh, who don't have, uh, um, are they dying at home? We don't know. Um, they are having symptoms that they're not presenting. So our ER utilization actually went down tremendously uh, because of this uh, lockdown when we did that. Um, so people are not, so this is one thing that is still up till now has been debated that what's happening to the people who were presenting with ST elevation MIs or myocardial infarction, the heart attacks we talk about. They, we don't see them anymore. Um, so um, there are four studies that looked at it and every actually city, my city, which is Houston, also did not have any significant uh, um, MI elevations actually, they went down significantly. Um, my, our patient, as you remember, was presenting with diarrhea. GI symptoms are very, very real. So don't, uh, as a matter of fact, I'll give you an example. The first case in my hospital came from a GI clinic. Uh, we did not have any patients who uh, were respiratory. They, we were, had patients who were having problems with GI, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and that was concerning. So please don't omit that. Um, my patient had diarrhea, and we uh, made sure that we uh, looked at that. These patients who are presenting in the ICU have a chance about 40% of them will have kidney failure. And uh, so that's why do not use medications, and we don't use medications in the ICU like NSAIDs, ibuprofen, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. So make sure that we don't use those kind of things um, in the ICU. We are starting dialysis early on these patients because they uh, uh, clot their kidneys and the autopsy results that we have done in pathology here are showing that. Um, and then one of the most important thing I wanted to discuss is that this uh, disease is presenting with the, these weird clotting phenomena where we are seeing uh, pulmonary embolisms, where we are seeing um, venous dopplers that are positive for uh, DVTs or deep venous thrombosis. And uh, these patients are more hypoxic. They're presenting with microthrombi we talk about. And I'm gonna touch that a uh, little bit there. So we are, we are anticoagulating these patients. So like my patient that we admitted, uh, we, got, we uh, anticoagulated him, started him on a heparin drip. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Because we know that uh, endo there is endothelial dysfunction when we, uh, and which causes hypercoagulability. And we are wanting to make sure that the low oxygenation, which causes more clotting. Uh, so we are having problem with low clotting to begin with. And then we are having low oxygenation, which causes clotting uh, further. Then these factors, the, um, T, uh, the tissue plasminogen activator uh, inhibitor is significantly higher in patients with um, lung problems. Uh, that causes cl clotting problems as well. Uh, so that, in addition, there is some anti-inflammatory theoretical benefit of heparin also, 
And that's why we use it in our patient population. We maintain a PTT somewhere but between 40 to 60, uh, and uh, that's what we are aiming for. So this patient of ours did get anticoagulation. Um, but I will tell you, there was a study that came out uh, in the, <clears throat> in the uh, I think it was JAMA, Lancet, and it, it was uh, from the Chinese, which showed that if a patient was started on heparin, and it was a big study, 200 in each arm, there was actually a little mortality benefit if you look at the patients who were severely sick and who were started on heparin, if they have a sick score of more than four. Now, sick score or SIC score, I'll tell you in the next day, I'm not sure if you guys use that over there, but you know, disseminated intravascular coagulation, we also call it DIC. Before a person reaches to DIC, there's a stage called SIC, which sick score. And that is uh, American College of Hematology has come up with that. Um, and this is what it is. I have put it put out there for you guys to see. On the right side of the screen, as you can see, the platelets are not less than 50, as in DIC. They are less than 100. The, P, the D dimer is not strongly that much increased. It is a little bit high. Our PTT, our PT is deranged. Our fibrinogen is not less than 100, like in DIC. So uh, you can call SIC basically a pre-DIC picture. And if your score, as you can see on that screen, is more than four, your chances of dying were high. And, and we, if we started you on heparin or anticoagulation, your chances of survival were better. So that is why we here are uh, trying to anticoagulate these patients um, on a regular basis if the D-dimer is high. Now, um, this is how, what my patient was treated as. Before going into a little bit more detail about uh, the non-invasive therapy, um, as you know, uh, the coronavirus get, uh, develops uh, uh, significant uh, diseases, and uh, the most common disease is pneumonia. So I'm going to talk about that, being a pulmonologist. Uh, it causes a thing called ARDS, Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. We use the Berlin Criteria formula, uh, formula which is uh, fairly common, and it's been used throughout the, wor throughout the world, I believe, uh, that if you have bilateral input traits on the chest X-ray within one week of your disease, if you are intubated and you have a PEEP of five or higher and your PF ratio, um, PF ratio stands for the arterial oxygen that you take from the uh, ABG and the FiO2, the inspired oxygen that you are taking from the ventilator. If that ratio is less than 300, then you have mild ARDS. If it is between 100 to 200, it is moderate ARDS and it's less than 100, it's severe ARDS. ARDS stands for Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. This is the Berlin definition, which is basically since 2003, we, everyone in the world has been using. Um, but before I go there, there was an interesting phenomena that was noted by the Italians, which was that when patients are presenting with this coronavirus, they have two phenotypes or two types of clinical presentation. One of them is that they have a high compliance. They are able to breathe okay. But despite breathing okay, they are oxygenating really, really poorly. So um, the question was, why is that? So they had thought that probably the, these people are developing small clots or microthrombi, which is causing the oxygen to be very, very low. Now, Dr. Um, Gattinoni is actually a very renowned um, Italian and pulmonologist and critical care physician who actually uh, takes care of these uh, patients and uh, when he said that, everyone was, uh, was very excited that we were seeing the same thing and we still see the same thing, that these patients are presenting with profound hypoxia, very, very low oxygen, but their chest x-rays are not as bad as you would expect from a PaO2 of 40, for example. Uh, and then the other group type is a low compliance, which we all know, it's the ARDS low compliance uh, uh, phenotype. So that is one of the things that uh, he described. But uh, time and time again, uh, you have to be very careful. If you are intubating someone, if their oxygenation is low and their chest texture looks okay, uh, they may be in the H phenotype. So please be careful. Usually follow the ARDS guidelines. On the website, if you can go ardsnet.org, you can see these protocols and you can follow them. They are free uh, for everyone to use. Um, so if you can see on, the, on this slide, it's very, very clear. Uh, this came out in 2012. If you have a really bad um, PF ratio, 
the higher your PF ratio, the more your mortality is. And not a lot of things have shown to improve mortality when you are um, on your, uh, when you are re relying on your um, PF ratio and it's getting worse. So on the right side of the screen, when you see the severe ARDS, when your PF ratio is less than 100, the death is more than 70% in, in some cases. So please be very careful when your oxygen is dropping and your ventilator requirement is going up, it means you have to change your strategy. So which oxygen strategy did I use on my patient? Um, usually the recommendations to keep the saturation is somewhere between um, 88 to 95%. And so you can use uh, therapies like nasal cannula. You, you can use uh, ther therapies like a non-rebreather mask that you can see on, on the, below the, here. Uh, but try to keep the saturation about 95 to 96 or higher. If you try to go higher than 97, 98%, as I've noticed here, you can cause atelectasis that can be detrimental. So keep your oxygen saturation between 88 to 92% uh, to, to 94%. And that's what we try to achieve here. Uh, we tried on our patient two days. Uh, our patient kept on uh, on these medications, but in, after two days, he had to be started on a BiPAP. What is a BiPAP? BiPAP is a machine that you put on your face like that, and you push air, and the patient and the machine helps the patient breathe um, significantly. So one of the problems that uh, was this was not recommended in the initial phases of the coronavirus was because when you have a face mask on and you put pressure air, the secretions are going everywhere when the patient is coughing. And that causes the healthcare worker to get exposed. So please make sure that when you use face, uh, face masks or BiPAP or a high flow uh, oxygen, then the exposure to you as, as a healthcare worker, to your nurses, to your respiratory therapist, it is very, very high. Um, one of the things that we use in America is called a high flow oxygen meter. It's called Vapotherm over here. I'm not sure if that's available, but you can deliver about 40 to 50 liters of oxygen with 100% concentration with this device that you can see on the right side. Again, the problem with that is that the virus will be all over and you have to be covering yourself with a face shield and a mask and everything. Um, one of the things that we did, this patient of mine, um, after two days, did not tolerate the BiPAP anymore and ended up being intubated. And we put the tube in him and he basically started having significant uh, uh, oxygenation problem again. So um, one of the things I will tell you, I'll take a moment and stop here um, before I go into vent management. Um, protect yourself. You guys protect yourself because you are healthcare worker. Uh, if you guys are going to get exposed, if you are exposed and you are sick, then the Pakistan healthcare system is that there are no doctors available. You are the last people that are standing there. You have to protect yourself, you have to protect your staff, and you have to try that you are not infected. Uh, the studies that we have done in New York and Italy. Wuhan, China, the healthcare workers got infected about 60%. Uh, you don't want to do that. protect And when you intubate someone, number one, intubate jab kar rahe Number two, when you're doing a bronchoscopy, when you are uh, doing any kind of procedures that are nebulizer, wear a face shield, wear a mask, cover your eyes, uh, take a shower as soon as you go home, change your clothes, do basic precautions because the lack of healthcare workers is what was the cause that caused the mortality in uh, Italian. That's why it's 14%. Uh, resources on Kipas ran out and uh, uh, all the healthcare workers, they basically got sick. And said, uh, people who were neurologists, people who were endocrinologists actually were managing the ventilators. Um, so please make sure that you protect yourself. That's why I wanted to make this point clear with you guys here. Uh, <clears throat> then uh, if you have significant problems, there are a few things if you're on the ventilator that will help that we do here. Is, and I'm sure you guys do that too. This study is very old, 2000, 20 years ago, this study came out and said that if you are on a ventilator, give them low or small tidal volumes. Tidal volume is the amount of air you're giving to the patient, give them with small amount. 
not with a 12 milliliters per kilogram ventilator. Give them six mLs per kg. And when they did that, the low tidal ventilation showed that there was a significant mortality uh, difference. As you can see, 31% versus 40%. Um, so that was the first trial ever 20 years ago that said, if you on the ventilator, if the patient has ARDS and you give them low tidal volumes, you will prevent death, which is great. And that's what we do here. And that's what our patient, my patient got started on low tidal volume ventilation. In addition to that, there's a new trial that came out in 2013, seven years ago, in New England Journal of Medicine, that said that if you prone the people for about 17 hours and uh, an average session of about four times in the whole ICU stay, you actually will save lives. Look at this, the error I have made. Um, the mortality difference between at 28 day in severe ARDS patients who have been uh, intubated there's a significant difference between the two. Look at this. Um, so more prone positioning works, and that's what my patient got. So we started proning this guy 17 hours and then putting him back. There are certain things that you should follow on prone positioning. I've uh, had an uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria. On the left side of the screen, if the patient is uh, having a, a tracheostomy, if the patient intracranial pressure is high because they have a brain bleed, if the patient has some problem with clots in the legs, if the patient has some facial trauma, obviously cardiac arrest, whatnot. If you cannot do them, these are exclusion criteria. But if your patient has severe ARDS with PF ratio of less than 150, they were included. And if their PEEP was five or higher, or their oxygenation was 60% or higher, they were included in the trial. And they basically showed that they had significant benefits. On the uh, screen on the left side, you would see bottom down here that the PF ratio, if it improves more than 150 and your oxygen uh, requirements are coming down less than 60, you can actually stop your um, proning positioning. So one of the things that we did use on this patient was prone positioning. <clears throat> Another thing that is actually in New England Journal came out about seven years ago was paralysis. If you paralyze patients on the ventilator, they don't use a lot of muscles they are more synchronized with the ventilator. Like if the ventilator is providing them with oxygenation, with ventilation, they're able to breathe very normally. So that also showed, if you see on the right side of the, of the chart, that the paralysis in the cystochronium group actually had benefit mortality wise to placebo. Now, I would tell you this information with a grain of salt because two years ago, um, as a matter of fact, last year, there was a new trial in New England Journal of Medicine that said, that if you do paralysis, the mortality is not very significantly different. So, but this is one of the things that we have in our patient uh, who uh, is only 35, we gave him paralysis, we gave him prone positioning. And despite that, uh, we, we thought that he would get better or not. But um, to summarize the previous things I've told you, number one, the only four things that have shown to improve mortality are, number one, low tidal volume ventilation, Number two, prone positioning. Number three, the paralysis that uh, may or may not help. And number four thing is ECMO. Now, what is ECMO? Let's talk about that a little bit for two minutes. Um, our patient actually ended up on ECMO because we uh, were not able to oxygenate him. His oxygenation uh, went, kept on going down, down, down to a point that he needed these two cannulas. I don't know if you're able to see this clearly, this is one cannula, this is ending up here, and this is the other cannula that's ending up here. These are two cannulas that are placed in his venous system, in the vena cava, where we get the blood out from the patient's body, circulate it through a machine, pass it through an oxygenator, and push it back into the patient close to the heart. That's what's happening here. So this is a machine called ECMO. It's extracorporeal membrane oxygenator. And uh, <clears throat> this is, these are two kinds of machines. The left side is the, called the Soren pump and the right side is called the Cardio Health pump. These are two different companies that actually use these pumps. Um, there are two kinds of ECMOs. One is called a VA ECMO, which is a veno arterial ECMO. And the other one is called a VV ECMO or veno venous ECMO. What is a VA ECMO? VA is, stands for venous, A stands for artery. Veno arterial ECMO means that you take out uh, blood from the vein and put it back into the descending aorta. As you can see from the left side of the screen, you take it out from the femoral vein 
and you're putting it into the femoral artery. The VA ECMO bypasses the heart and the lung versus VV ECMO only bypasses the lung. So for ARDS, for patients who are very, very sick with lung problems only, we use VV ECMO, which is the right side, number B. And the patients who have heart and lung problems both, we use VA ECMO, okay? This is another diagram or an illustration of what a VV ECMO or where it is placed. If you can see on the left side of the screen, we are pulling the blood, as you can see the, from the arrow, from the femoral vein. Having circulated through a machine, passing it through an oxygenator, and putting it back on the IJ, internal jugular vein, close to the heart, okay? And on the right side of the screen, you would see a double lumen cannula where we are taking blood out from the right atrium, as you can see from below on the right side, and we are putting it back into the right atrium. So we take blood out from the SVC, right above the right atrium, and we take blood out from the IVC, and it is a dual lumen cannula. It means it has two lumens uh, that suck the blood out, and then from one lumen, it goes in and close to the heart. So our, uh, because we are a tertiary center and we, uh, we have ECMO facilities um, available, and uh, this is uh, in the Texas Medical Center, so we ended up putting the patient on ECMO. Uh, <clears throat> we also use something called the oxygen index to calculate if the patient will need ECMO or not, which is calculated by the mean um, airway pressure and FiO2 and PaO2. And we use a thing called the RESP score. It's a free score that is available on the website. Um, it's called the RESP score, and you can calculate that. Uh, <clears throat> patients who need ECMO are very, very sick. Their oxygen is very, very low, but this is the international uh, guidelines or international data. This everything, every machine that we put on, on ECMO, it actually goes into the um, database, this registry, as you can see. If you take a look at on the adult side, the patient, about 24,000 people have, have been ecmo in this world. Out of those, it means that these are people who are failing all ventilator therapies. There is no ventilator and now patients are actually on the ECMO machine. Look at the survival on the right side to discharge, 60%. This is like a dialysis of the lungs, basically, in short terms. So this is something that has been slowly getting uh, traction, as you can see. Uh, and we are um, trying to get this thing <clears throat> as much as possible to, um, to provide the service. We are the only hospital that actually goes to different hospitals and put these ECMO machines and bring the patients to us. So we are a tertiary center, so we do that. Um, as you can see, ECMO has been used in COVID-19 patients throughout the world. About 1,500 patients have been uh, ECMO'd, and you can see about survival is still 56%. 494 survived. So that's pretty good, in my opinion. Uh, <clears throat> this is our patient. So this is what happened to him. On the left side of the screen, he basically ended up having a severe ARDS. You see the white out of the screen on the both sides. This is when he had the ECMO cannulas in. And uh, this is after 18 days of being on the ECMO machine. We come down on the ventilator support. His x-ray started clearing up and we were successfully able to get the ECMO machine off. And uh, overall, the, the patient did well. This is the complication. One thing that I did not mention, I wanted to mention <clears throat> that patients who have bad lungs, this can happen to them. There is subcutaneous air everywhere. The patient has severe better trauma, causing pneumopericardium, causing a pneumothorax, and significant uh, hemodynamic compromise. This actually happened while the patient was on ECMO. Um, so we had to actually come down on the ventilator support completely so that uh, this thing can heal. Um, so that's pretty much where we are. Um, you, you have listened a lot about multiple ventilators. Um, this strategy has not been proven. So please do not try it over there. I know that the ventilators are not freely available in Pakistan. Um, and people are doing multiple ventilators. The problem with that is, as you can see, each and every point, if you please note that, that if you have two or three ventilators attached to one circuit, or sorry, two or three patients attached to one ventilator, you'd have no idea how much uh, tidal volume you're giving to them. You have no idea how much PEEP you're giving to them. These ventilators are not programmed 
are set for multiple uh, patients. Uh, if a patient has a cardiac arrest, you cannot even ventilate one person. How will you ventilate the two other that are hooked up to this patient? So please don't try these things, uh, which have, you can see it on YouTube. People are doing this. I do not recommend that. Multiple ventilators are not recommended by the Society of Critical Care Medicine, and actually they can cause harm to your patients. So don't try this. Uh, this is one of the things that we have, uh, this is my last slide, uh, one of the last slides uh, <clears throat> that actually we created in March. Um, and it's an algorithm if someone would want to uh, uh, get this, that what are we doing uh, as far as uh, therapies are concerned. Uh, these are the therapies that we were doing at that time. This is an algorithm that we created in our hospital and in my group created. Um, and in Houston, uh, we have a collaboration. And so if you guys want to share, uh, get that, we can do that. Now, this is actually the last slide. And after the whole lecture, I would say that America has been so much progress. And I have told you so many things that we are doing here. In addition to that, आप देखिए कि यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स के क्या हाल हैं और यूरोपियन यूनियन के क्या हाल हैं हमारे केसेस अभी तक बहुत ज्यादा हैं हमारी अभी भी बहुत ज्यादा मौत हो रही है जबकि यूरोप में ये सब कुछ नहीं है तो उसकी वजह क्या है उसकी वजह ये है कि यहां पे लोगों ने लॉकडाउन को फेशियल मास्क को सीरियस नहीं लिया जो कि मैं सुन रहा हूं कि वहां पे भी शायद लोग नहीं ले रहे तो अगर एक चीज मैं आप लोगों को बता सकता हूं कि इतनी तरक्की के बाद और इतने the remdesivirs or steroids or ECMO or ventilators ke baawajood hamara ye haal hai aur uski wahid wajah ye hai ke people are not taking these things seriously ke apne aap ko protect kare agar aap apne aap ko protect karenge to aap dusron ko protect kar sakenge so this is extremely crucial the only thing in my whole uh, thing agar main aapko kahun maine jo mention nahi ki jo kaam kyunki critical care ki presentation thi the only one few things that have proven to decrease the the prevalence and the incidence of this disease is prevention jab tak vaccine nahi aayegi this thing will not go down and we are in for a very very bad ride i told you ke spanish flu mein 50 million log mare the and here and we have the same case fatality hamare paas ye same kaam hone wala hai agar hum log ehtiyat nahi karenge so Just uh, one thing is, जो क्या चीजें काम आई हैं नंबर वन अपने आप को कवर कीजिए फेस मैक्स पहनिए अगर आप फेस मैक्स पहनेंगे तो अगर आप एसिम्टोमेटिक कैरियर हैं आप दूसरों को नहीं देंगे अपने हाथ वॉश कीजिए अपने कपड़े चेंज कीजिए अपने आप को नहलाइए अपने हेल्थ केयर वर्कर्स को आप अपने आप को अपने रेस्पिरेटरी थेरेपिस्ट को अपने नर्सेस को इन सब को बहुत बहुत ज्यादा हिफाजत करके रखिए वरना इट्स गोइंग टू बी अ रेली रेली बैड सिचुएशन इन पाकिस्तान अनफॉर्चुनेटली लेकिन इन शाह दिस शूट टू शेल फैस और अगर मेरे पास कोई क्वेश्चन है आई एम बिलिंग टू टेक दम राइट नाउ किसी को अगर सवाल पूछना है तो Sorry, I'm going to mute everybody else and if somebody wants to raise their hand then we will let them ask their questions now. जी मोहम्मद सैयद रजी मोहम्मद प्लीज असलाकुम Dr. Rah, I'm Professor Syed Razi Muhammad from Muhammad Medical College, Mirpur Khas. Uh, very nice presentation. Thank you very much. I just wanted to ask, what is the overall fatality in your ICU from COVID-19? So we are a very. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can. Very aggressive uh, um, center actually here. So uh, as you know that we do uh, ECMOs. and we do um, mechanical ventilations and everything and all advanced therapies um, our mortality um, with covid-19 has not been as bad as projected because we um, have uh, the uh, the ecmo machines and so on and so forth uh, i can tell you we have put in about uh, when our patients get sicker we put them on the ecmo machine and uh, are out of the say, 16 that we have done so far uh, we have only had three deaths uh, on the ecmo um people really? have died for other reason as well like a, a cardiac arrest because of some they were a transplant patient for example um so <clears throat> our mortality or case fatality rate has not been that high as it's projected which is weird because mere puri city mein and i don't know because we are the medical center or yahan pe kafi bade bade centers hain and aggressive hain 
Um, maybe that's the reason. But the whole city case fatality is about 1.4 uh, or 1.8 percent, as compared to the rest of the country, which is about close to three percent. Um, so our uh, case fatality is lower. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, the, uh, Dr. Ross, thank you very much. Uh, it was uh, a very uh, detailed and excellent presentation. I just uh, want to know two things. One is uh, you must have heard about uh, the uh, practice of plasma transfusion. Uh, they're talking about plas plasma transfusion of patients who are recovered from this COVID. And number two, um, uh, the use of uh, uh, aspirin. Is there any role of aspirin as anticoagulant in, in a bit later stage when one is hospitalized? Thank you. Yeah, very good question, sir. Um, yeah, I should have mentioned that. I'm sorry I did not include that in my, in, in my um, presentation. But yes, uh, yes to both of things. Uh, number one, uh, convalescent plasma which is basically the um, plasma of non-infected IgG positive patients um, has been shown to reduce the um, duration of the, uh, of, of the disease. Um, it has not shown that it actually causes a mortality benefit. Um, so our, my patient did receive convalescent plasma uh, and it still it actually is in the trial uh, format uh, in the United States. It is not a randomized controlled trial that we have seen. Uh, but it, uh, we use it as what we call it as a compassionate use. Uh, uh, term hai ke if, if, even if it is a not uh, a randomized controlled trial, if it doesn't cause that much harm, you may use it. It has not caused any uh, mortality uh, benefit, uh, number one. All it does, uh, we are using it in patients who have a severe ARDS who are on the ventilator and they're not getting better in, the, in day or two. So we are using that um, convalescent plasma on those patient population only, not in, on the hospital and not uh, when they are not, uh, they don't have symptoms, number one. Uh, your, uh, your question about aspirin usage and antiplatelet therapy is, uh, is very good, actually. Um, to um, <clears throat> emphasize on my point that we are using uh, full dose anticoagulation therapy, um, we are um, trying to use that as much as possible. Um, um, and if we are, if our D dimers are not high, uh, then uh, we are not. We are only putting them on aspirin. Um, so we are using aspirin um, in 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 a low D dimer patients. But if our D dimer is more than four, uh, then we are fully anticoagulating them uh, with PTT goal of forty to sixty. Right. There's a few more questions here with with regards to. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, somebody's asked about uh, three drugs here, ivermectin, famotidine, and ribavirin, and Montelukast. Uh, that's a big list there. But if you, if you have any data, data on any of these. So Montelukast, okay. yeah, and famotidine. None of, the, none of these patients, none of these drugs have, uh, have data. Um, and I know they have some sort of like a, a benefit as far as, um, you know, um, as far as uh, your... Um, Theory is concerned, but there are no randomized controlled trial that have shown that these things will help you. Um, so we are not using um, ribavirin. We are not using a Montelukast. We are not using ivermectin. And I think, the, what was the last drug? I'm Femotidine. Sure. Femotidine. Yeah, Femotidine actually, as a matter of fact, um, in, in all critical, critically ill patients, we use uh, what we call an H2 blocker. Um, either a, a pantoprazole or um, femotidine um, or ranitidine um, so, or so on and so forth. Um, because, not because of the uh, SARS virus or the um, COVID-19 virus, but because uh, of the fact that we um, use it for a peptic ulcer disease prophylaxis. That's what we use it for in the ICU. And because our patients are on high dose of steroids, which is one of another uh, problem that uh, you can have peptic ulcer disease. Uh, that's why we put them on H2 blocker of emotidine. So we do use right. them in the ICU. Thank you. There's one more question from uh, Atiyavari. Any guidelines on anticoagulant and tocilizumab in children? 
I don't know. Um, I cannot comment on children because I'm not uh, a okay. pediatrician uh, at all. So I, I would prefer not to comment on pediatric uh, literature. But I can actually um, say that uh, in adult literature, um, the um, guidelines for tocilizumab, as I said, there is a randomized controlled trial um, that is going on right now. The results of that would be uh, December, 9, uh, December 19, 2020. Um, and that will give us a really good data, but we are using tocilizumab uh, not on everyone at all, um, okay. because that's very, uh, and as I said, in my experience, it's caused significant comorbid conditions um, I, I'm dealing with right now. Okay, Professor Sophia Farouk, uh, time for administration for remdesivir. Um, good question. Uh, remdesivir, actually, in the trial that uh, if you go uh, with the with the New England Journal study that just came out, um, uh, usually uses um, early phase, which means that um, not in the replication phase, when you are starting uh, to require oxygen therapy, um, we have severe bilateral pulmonary infiltrates, and your oxygen requirements are worsening. Uh, that is, in my opinion, in our opinion, is the time to use remdesivir. Like our patient received a remdesivir um, the first to third day because his symptoms were going on for the last four or five days. He was uh, getting worse and worse and he presented with significant hypoxemia with bilateral infiltrates. So he got remdesivir the first day when he was admitted to the ICU. So right. I, if you were to use it three to five, five days, maybe this is what we, I would say. Five days. One more question. You mentioned ACE uh, receptors. Is there any role of ACE2 blockers? Uh, no, not at all. Um, this has been uh, done uh, in multiple trials and studies in the in the last uh, two months. Uh, um, and I think Jack had a good article, Lancet had a good article on that. And they actually have looked at, uh, the concept was if we will give ACE inhibitors, um, what we are doing is we are causing the, the virus to replicate more or stay in the body longer because it uses the ACE uh, to receptor on the uh, epithelial cells. But that has proven to be false. And now the American Heart Association actually is recommending to continue with the uh, ACE inhibitors if your patient is on those. So don't stop them. So okay. no back on that. Um, is convalescent plasma for critically sick, can it be given in a state of a cytokine storm? In this state, does it hurt more than beneficial? So convalescent plasma is, uh, again, as I said, it's still, that's also in a randomized controlled trial. So all these things that we are using right now, unfortunately, have no clear cut answers. Um, this is all esoteric data. You know, you see your patient, they are very, very sick. They're very, very ill. This is like, like uh, uh, you know, the kitchen sink at, at, at these people. Um, they're out of desperation because we don't have data. Um, so I would be very, very cautious on using that. Um, but as far as detrimental is concerned, I know there is some concern about giving a convalescent plasma because it can cause much worsening. The only thing I could think about that it may cause more um, um, ARDS kind of a, a situation if you, are, um, if you can get transfusion-related infections or um, trans trolley, we call it, transfusion-related acute lung injury. Uh, so you can have that. Um, sure. But okay. uh, apart from that, uh, I don't think that um, we have seen a lot of um, deterioration when we give convalescent plasma to these patients. Thank you, Dr. Sen. One more question. Jalil Khan from Peshawar. Jalil Khan from Peshawar. I've unmuted him. Can you, Jalil Khan, can you hear us? Uh, it's a raised hand, but I've tried to unmute it, but it's not working. Dr. Jalil Khan, can you type your question for us, please? It's not allowing me to. Right in the chat box, there we go. Professor Sophia Farouk again, adding to this question, does cytokine release lower BP by causing vasodilation? 
Oh, definitely. Um, yes, lower B. Yes, it does lower the b blood pressure for sure. Um, so, so as you understand that cytokine rush basically causes you to have severe vasodilation. The shock is vasodilatory shock when you have severe cytokine rush. Um, so these patients are in profound hypotension or low blood pressure. Uh, and um, we usually are using uh, pressors or vasopressors, um, preferably uh, we start with levofed and we add uh, vasopressin on top of them uh, if they need to. Okay, any further questions on the chat box? Can we use direct factor 10A inhibitors? No studies on that and we, we don't use them right now. Can you, you can do a randomized controlled trial and then use them. I would, I would uh, not use isoterical data from one case reports or two case reports because these medications have severe consequences. And as you know, these uh, IL-6, IL-10 inhibitors, they are basically blunting your immune response. So you will develop co co-infection with other, other really bad uh, organisms. So please use them very, very uh, carefully if you are wanting to use them. Radio. Uh... Role of rivaroxaban in home isolating patients needing oxygen to maintain SATs. Any experience of favipiravir in your setting? Uh, no, I, we haven't. Uh, we haven't done that. What is favipiravir? Is it like one of the viral medications? No, yeah, antiviral. Yeah, I, yeah, I uh, looks like a viral medication by the name of it. I'm I'm not uh, familiar with it. We're not using that. Um, Ribavirin, uh, riboxaban. I think it's. Are you talking about anticoagulation on that those patients? Um, oh, reinfection. It's a very good question, actually, whoever is yeah, talking about um, that. Yeah, so, so the two things I'm going to tell you about uh, reinfection is that um, what we are seeing is that the nasopharyngeal swabs are basically negative um, in these patients, and sometimes the tracheal aspirate is positive. Nobody knows what to make of that. Uh, I don't know if that is... Uh, a remnant of the viruses that has left and you are not infectious or what. Um, reinfection, we are seeing it now in, in China and uh, we are not seeing it here yet because I think our wave um, has gone just, just like you know a, a month ago. Um, so reinfection is a real possibility here. Um, but what I will add to that is co-infection. About 21 to 25% of the patients with COVID-19 are presenting with other infections as well, like your regular community acquired pneumonia, like your, uh, you know, uh, mycobacterial diseases that you are, uh, mycoplasma, like your hemophilus influenza, your strep. Uh, so please treat them with uh, azithromycin or uh, rocephin, which is ceftriaxone, which is a regular community acquired pneumonia kind of a, a medication if they are in the ICU. So treat them like a regular pneumonia on top of the, your coronavirus treatment uh, because 25% of the time there is co-infection with them. Amna BB. Uh, Amna BB, can you put your question through please? Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much for uh, such a nice presentation. I have a question uh, which is related to the uh, protocol for oxygen use in non-hospitalized patients. Because most of the people are using oxygen and uh, doctors are prescribing the use of oxygen at home. What are the um, pro proper protocols for the using oxygen in non-hospitalized patients? Um, that's a good question, actually. Nobody knows the answer to that, uh, to be honest with you. Um, um, I think um, if you go back in my uh, <clears throat> presentation, um, that's my, what my thing is. If, if a patient is developing hypoxia, um, they are in the 20% range uh, group. The 20% group who have symptoms and who have severe symptoms to a point that they are needing oxygen. As you all know, that you, uh, God has given us two lungs. Even if I take one lung out and throw it away, I can still live with one lung if that one lung is working fine. So the fact that a, a, a person is needing oxygen <clears throat> and at home is dangerous in itself. Uh, it means your, your oxygen capacity or delivery is so low. Remind, uh, mind you that most of these patients have normal heart 
So they're not getting no oxygen because they are in heart failure. They are getting oxygen on oxygen because they are they have coronavirus positive and they are needing oxygen. So prescribing oxygen at home is dangerous because you don't know how to monitor these patients. And by default, by giving them oxygen, you have proven that this patient is very, very sick, is in that 20% uh, uh, group that will need hospitalization. And those people who were actually needing hospitalization, those 20% of the people actually died about 15 to 20% of the time. So if you have oxygen to discharge oxygen, you have diagnosed it, you have to keep it so you so check the patient actually needs very uh, monitored care they they should not be in home they should be probably in a monitored setting uh, or uh, with a doctor uh, another question from Vaseem raja can hep b and hep c antivirals be used for covid-19 uh, i do not know that it's a good question i don't know there's no data on that actually as a matter of fact aapki presentation se pehle abhi maine uh, i actually went in and uh, looked at pubmed and did a literature search and saw that there were like, um, I believe 23,000 articles in the last three, four, two, three to four months, which is unheard of. Um, so maybe someone is doing those things I, I'm not sure about, I'm sorry. Okay, Dr. Jalil Khan, can you, hear, can, can you put your question through? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, my question is about, um, uh, you mentioned about BIPOP. The problem, the issue in Pakistan is uh, a lot of people are reluctant to go to hospital. So hence the question about the oxygen at home came. The same thing is about BIPOP because uh, our ICU beds are full. So will you recommend, uh, you know, BIPOP because of the risk uh, infection you just mentioned, um, you know, in the ward uh, where there are other uh, positive patients as well? Um, number one. Number two was about the River Roxaban. River Roxaban is basically uh, the novel or the DOC or the uh, novel anticoagulant. So in Pakistan, people with a D-dimer of 250 or something with a very mild and moderate disease, doctors are prescribing. So my question is, if patient is not um, bed-bound and mobile, do we need to prescribe that or not? So it's two questions, basically. Thank you. Um, so so, the, so again, the, I think the question, uh, I, if I understand, is that um, the first question was BiPAP therapy in patients who are, who are uh, in the hospital setting, I believe, um, so I, I think the, the answer to that, I, I, I was talking about in my slides were if you are, um, on by, yes, first of all, yes. So you can use non-invasive therapies, uh, in the hospital setting. That's true. Um, that will actually help reduce your work of breathing. Number two, that will give you high oxygen, um, concentration. And number three, that will, that may help eliminate your, uh, distress as well. But, um, when you will, you are on BiPAP, as you understand, there is a leak that is happening as well, and you are exposing other patients, uh, or uh, most importantly, uh, your staff to um, to the aerosolization, and which is the highest level of exposure. Um, so you have to be very careful. So what we have done, or the Italians have done is that when you are on BiPAP, they actually have a, like a big hood on on uh, people. Um, which actually covers them uh, so that the aerosolization doesn't affect that much. You can also do that by creating a little uh, environment like a plastic shield around your patient's bed um, so that they don't uh, affect other people as well and the aerosolization stays in, in, one, uh, in one area. Um, the other question of the anticoagulant I, I understand is uh, that there is not a lot of uh, <clears throat> therapy um, or hospital beds are full. So I think that I would probably be okay as, as in, in, um, in America, there are a lot of consequences of for the, any medication that you prescribe. Uh, Rabuoxaban is basically, um, I think uh, it's a, a direct thrombin inhibitor, I believe. Uh, so you, it is a very potent anticoagulant. So I uh, would be very carefully prescribed that. Uh, you can do that as I have told you about 10 to 15% of the people have hypercoagulable state. Um, they will be bed bound because they are short of breath. They will not be moving. So I- um, Is it mild, in mild, is it recommended if the dimer is slightly raised, but patient is uh, got mild uh, disease and is not dyspneic? Yes, if the D-dimer is elevated, as I said, is if it's more than four, 
than anticoagulation, we do do that. But um, on that caveat, I'll tell you that the American Society of Hematology has recommended against the anticoagulation of uh, they do not recommend that. Uh, with aspirin or so, but not with full anticoagulation. Um, there is a chance of these people developing DVTs when they are discharged from the hospital. And so they do recommend 90 days of uh, preventive therapy, which is uh, enoxaparin 40 milligram sub Q daily, um, but not uh, full anticoagulation also. So um, that's the data. But uh, when patients are in the ICU on the ventilator and very, very sick and hypoxic, that's the time when we use full anticoagulation. So I would be very, very careful on, in giving anticoagulation at home in, in mild symptom patients. I, I, I would be very uh, worried. That was a fantastic presentation and a good question answer session. We'd uh, recommend people to put their questions on the Facebook page and we will endeavor to answer those at the next possible availability. Thank you, Dr. Rathasan. That was an amazing presentation and full, full of information for Pakistan. Well, thank you very much for giving the opportunity. Really, I appreciate you guys. And, and I just will tell you one thing, please be safe. Uh, take care of yourself. You guys are the assets. You guys uh, are the people that who will actually save a lot of people. So advise people to wear face masks, wash hands, change clothes, and, and be careful. All the best. Thank you once again. Thank you for joining us. Take care. Right. So that's our, that, that was our critical care consultant, the front line, doing some groundbreaking work over there in tertiary care units with the ECMO machines. And it's really inspirational to see expatriate Pakistanis performing abroad uh, like that. Next, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Najib Ahmed, who is a, a Royal College of Radiology Regional Chair, uh, Lancashire, South Yorkshire. He's an honorary lecturer as well in Hull University Hospital, a fantastic radiology consultant and inspirational guy. Uh, over to Dr. Najib Ahmed, please. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction. My name is Najib Ahmed. I'm a consultant in radiology. Uh, I work primarily in the Hull University Teaching Hospital, uh, but I also have an honorary position as a lecturer with the Hull York Medical School, and I also work with the Royal College of Radiology uh, in my region. The reason uh, for me uh, to give this talk is that radiology is at the forefront. So uh, let me start sharing my screen. So I hope you can see the presentation. Can I, can I request if anybody who is not on mute to put on mute until we open the session for question and answers. Um, so this is the, uh, the disease spread within the UK. And uh, the reason why I think it's important to discuss radiology at an early stage is that we have learned quite a few lessons. Um, as you can see, that the peak was late March, early April. And during this time, we have learned quite a few things about how to manage these patients, how to image these patients, and the practical uh, problems that we have seen. So, जो मेरी टॉक है उसका बुनियादी मकसद ये है कि आप तक वो इनफॉरमेशन पहुंचाना कि जो हमने सीखा है यहां से आई एम श्योर पाकिस्तान हैज गॉट अ फैंटास्टिक रेडियोलॉजिस्ट आई एम नॉट गोइंग टू प्रोड्यूस एनी मोर रेडियोलॉजिस्ट इन द नेक्स्ट हाफ एन आवर बट यू नो द मेन रीजन फॉर ऑल ऑफ दिस इज टू गिव यू एन आईडिया ऑफ व्हाट हैव वी हैव लर्न एज अ डिपार्टमेंट एंड आई होप के दिस कैन बी यूज्ड appropriately with uh, hindsight in, in Pakistan. Audience, it's quite varied. Um, it's quite difficult to pitch a conversation with such a variable number of people. I'm hoping that we've got uh, clinical uh, you know, medicine consultants, respiratory physicians, intensive care, anesthesia, and radiology. And some of them, are in managerial positions looking after the hospitals. So, my goal is that you can reach all the things 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 that you can reach
किसी ना किसी तरीके से रेलिवेंट हों फॉर मैनेजमेंट मैनेजमेंट ऑफ दीज पेशेंट तो दिस इज नॉट गोइंग टू बी शोइंग लवली इमेजेस ऑफ यू नो सी टी और एक्सरे सम ऑफ दिस इज डेफिनेटली रेडियोलॉजी बट अम लॉर्ड ऑफ इट इज एक्चुअली हाउ यू प्रैक्टिकली इमेज दीज पेशेंट एंड वॉट आर द वेरियस थिंग यू नीड टू बी अवेयर अबाउट so this is a synopsis of my talk uh, i'm going to talk about uh, kaise ek department prepare kar sakta hai you know radiology department is a key uh, part of hospital it is very important particularly in the context of pakistan kyunki hamare paas kuch shehron mein to sahat peak aa chuki hai shayad thodi aur aayegi kuch jagahon pe shayad nahi aayegi to hamare paas ek opportunity hai ki we can prepare appropriately प्रिपरेशन के साथ हमें ये भी देखना है कि विच पेशेंट्स आर सूटेबल फॉर इमेजिंग जो पेशेंट्स को इमेजिंग की जरूरत है हाउ डू यू इमेज देम अप्रोप्रिएटली व्हाट इज द राइट टेक्निक ऑफ इमेजिंग बिकॉज इफ यू गोइंग टू गेट द टेक्निक राइट यू आर गोइंग टू फाइंड दैट यू विल गेट बेटर रिजल्ट विच इवन विद प्लेन रेडियोलॉजी जो उसके बाद हमारे थोड़ा सा डिस्कशन होगा वो इमेज एनालिसिस पे आई विल गिव यू सम एग्जाम्पल ऑफ वेरियस केसेज विच वी हैव कम अक्रॉस और सबसे आखिर में आई विल रीकैप एंड गिव यू एन आइडिया ऑफ वेरियस बिट्स एंड पीसेस वी हैव लर्न्ड अलोंग द वे हमारे पास हाइंडसाइट की कमी थी उस वक्त चीजें डेवलप हो रही थी एंड वी हैड टू लर्न वाइल वी वर फेसिंग दिस पेंडेमिक तो इसलिए आई होप दैट यू विल फाइंड दिस इंफॉर्मेशन यूजफुल क्योंकि हमारे पास वेरिएबल ऑडियंस हैव यूज्ड दिस स्मॉल विनियट्स टू आइडेंटिफाई व्हिच स्लाइड्स आर मोर रिलेवेंट टू व्हिच टाइप ऑफ पार्टिसिपेंट्स uh to help you make uh, you know if you, if you, if it is entirely to do with radiologists then i have put it here so you know if you if you don't understand as in depth then it's not a problem um but i hope that will make you uh, comfortable uh, in you know trying to uh, you know uh, get the information which i am trying to get to so very briefly we start off ke how we you know prepare for a search We know that a surge will come. Pakistan के कुछ इलाकों में आ चुकी है और ये under development ने कुछ इलाकों में आएगी. तो ये जरूरी है कि थोड़ा सा ये सोचा जाए at a hospital managerial level कि how you are going to manage this. Uh, you know, so इसमें logistics हैं, इसमें बहुत सारी चीजें हैं depending on इसमें काफी चीजें depend करती हैं कि department का layout कैसा है, कितने cameras हैं, etc. etc. लेकिन जो जो practical considerations हैं कि you will have to decide के कौन सा जो है वो कॉरिडोर जो है वो कोविड पेशेंट्स के लिए होगा कौन सा नहीं होगा किस तरह आप लोग सोशल डिस्टेंसिंग को मैनेज करेंगे वेटिंग रूम में स्कैनर uh, की और आपकी जो रेडियोलॉजी रिपोर्टिंग की इक्विपमेंट है उसको किस तरीके से आप मेक श्योर sure करेंगे कि इट इज स्टेराइल एंड नॉट सोर्स ऑफ ट्रांसमिशन ऑफ द वायरस और इसलिए बहुत जरूरी है कि देर इज अनफ डेटा अवेलेबल टू टू बी श्योर दैट ट्रांसमिशन हॉस्पिटल एनवायरनमेंट में जो हेल्थ केयर प्रोफेशन को हो रहा है उसमें बहुत ज्यादा जो तादाद है वो उन, उन लोगों की है जो अपने ही कोलीग से इन्फेक्ट हो रहे हैं या फिर जो वहां पर इक्विपमेंट है उसकी डिकंटामिनेशन ना होने की वजह से पेशेंट टू डॉक्टर ट्रांसमिशन अगर सोशल अगर आपके पास पर्सनल प्रोटेक्टिव इक्विपमेंट है तो इट इज बेट लेस तो इसलिए बहुत जरूरी है Okay, although this seems very uh, sort of basic information, but it is important to put your thoughts together. How you going to make sure that your department is not transmitting infection among each other? इसके अलावा कुछ और चीजें हैं कि जैसे most likely आपके जो जो available चीजें हैं वो cameras they will not be accessible if one is dedicated to COVID या कुछ ultrasound machines या radiography units. तो obviously you will not be able to produce as many uh, or go through as many patients so you have to have a plan ke jab ye aista aise cheeze khatam ho jaye to how will you go back to your normal uh, working pattern and how will you potentially cope with the the backlog which is uh, waiting for you staff training within radiology department is important because they will know how to use ppe and particularly important how they clean the the various uh, equipments or between each patients uske alawa jo ek important cheez hai wo ye hai ki we have got fantastic uh, uh, support staff radiographers are very very uh, uh, well equipped 
टू आइडेंटिफाई इंसिडेंटल फाइंडिंग्स तो उनको थोड़ा सा ये बताना कि कुछ पेशेंट्स में जो कि नॉन कोविड इमेजिंग की वजह से प्रेजेंट कर रहे हैं दे मे कम अक्रॉस सिचुएशन वेल दे फाइंड समथिंग इन दी इन द चेस व्हिच लुक्स लाइक कोविड एंड हाउ टू डील विद इट तो ये थोड़ी सी uh, उनकी जो एजुकेशन है जरूरी है आई विल गिव यू एन एग्जांपल लेटर ऑन हाउ वी कैन डू इट सो और उसके अलावा अगेन वेरी बेसिक्स के हाउ यू टू मेक श्योर द डिपार्टमेंट स्टाफ अप्रोप्रिएटली अगर स्टाफ सिक होगा इट्स ऑलमोस्ट सर्टेन दैट बिटवीन इफ इट इज अ पीक यू विल फाइंड दैट बिटवीन 10 टू 20% ऑफ योर स्टाफ मे बी अनवेल and they may have to self isolate so you have to have some sort of a semblance as to how you will make sure the department works safely um usme kuch examples hamare paas hi hain ke humne we have instituted home uh, working we have given some uh, equipment to some of the radiologists who are considered high risk and they were able to work from home so that this is one of the solution but pakistan ke tanazur mein there will be other options available uh, with regards to local resources Uh, so I'm not going to go through details of what we have done. My main issue is to make sure that you identify this and plan appropriately. So next, our discussion is that the most you know it's very easy to get imaging in everybody, but it is important to realize that actually imaging is necessary. Because if you don't deploy the imaging in a proper way, then it is possible that in a resource-constrained environment, 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 वहाँ पर द सिस्टम विल बिकम ओवर वन तो इसलिए ये बहुत जरूरी है समझना कि एक्चुअली विच पेशेंट विल बेनिफिट द मोस्ट फ्रॉम इमेज एंड देर फॉर देन यू विल बी इन अ बेटर पोजिशन टू यूटिलाइज योर रिसोर्स अप्रोप्रिएटली तो कौन से पेशेंट्स में इमेजिंग इज गोइंग टू बी हेल्पफुल सो सबसे पहले क्लिनिकल क्वेश्चन patients is already in the hospital or has been confirmed covid uh, by other mechanism like uh, rt pcr and you want to sh- make sure that you know they've got a baseline and so that you can monitor their progression uske alawa ek bahut common question jo radiology mein poocha jata hai ki jo patients asymptomatic hain can we use imaging to risk stratify them uh yani ki for example non covid hospital attendances अगर कोई प्रेजेंट कर रहा है किसी और uh, और uh, हमारे पास आरटीपीसीआर की अवेलेबिलिटी नहीं है तो कैन बी यूज इमेजिंग टू आइडेंटिफाई दोस्ट पेशेंट हुआ नॉट येट सिम्टोमेटिक कुछ जगहों से मेरे पास ये भी सवाल आया था पिछले दिनों के जो पेशेंट के साथ अटेंडेंट पाकिस्तान में यूजली uh, होते हैं uh, तो क्या उनको भी यू नो इमेजिंग करनी चाहिए टू मेक श्योर दैट दे आर एक्चुअली नॉट तो आई विल ट्राई टू एड्रेस दीज वेल वाइल वी गो अलॉन्ग जो हमारे पास इस वक्त अवेलेबल बायोमार्कर्स हैं उसमें एज यू ऑल नो आर टी पी सी आर है इम्यूनोग्लोबल एंटीबॉडी एसे हैं और उसके बाद रेडियोलॉजी है आई विल नॉट बी टॉकिंग टू मच अबाउट आर टी पी सी आर एंड एंटीबॉडी एसे उसमें सिर्फ इतनी बताना जरूरी समझता हूँ कि आर टी पी सी आर इज गॉट सेंसिटिविटी अराउंड सेवेंटी परसेंट एंड इट इज क्वाइट स्पेसिफिक इवन अप्रोचिंग हंड्रेड परसेंट बिकॉज इट विल नॉट स्पेसिफिक इन्फॉर्मेशन कमिंग आउट इज फाइनेंशियल तो कल ही मैं जब देख रहा था तो यू नो यू वेरी वेलकम टू लुक एट दिस आर्टिकल इन नेचर मेडिसिन प्रोवाइड्स अ सॉलिड data uh, of uh, immunoglobulin assay in asymptomatic patients but i will not be able to go through in too much detail because that's outside my in my area of expertise so we'll concentrate on chest x ray and ct um, in the next few slides and what we'll try to do is uh, we will try to understand how these can be used and what is the data for it to be used. जैसे पहले बिफोर आई स्टार्ट डिस्कसिंग इन टू मच डिटेल अबाउट दीज टू मोडालिटीज वी हैव टू अंडरस्टैंड चेस रेडियोलॉजी इवन बिफोर कोविड 19 एक दुनिया की पहले भी अगर आप बोलना गए हो तो तीन चार महीने पहले की बात है तो उसमें भी चेस रेडियोलॉजी वाज नॉन स्पेसिफिक इट वाज वेरी सेंसिटिव उसकी वजह यह है कि लंग्स वेन एवर दे आर इंजर्ड और इंसल्टेड टू रिस्पॉन्ड इन a few ways only you know they will become white uh, they will have an infiltrate chai wo 
इन्फेक्शन हो इन्फ्लेमेशन हो या ट्यूमर इन्फिल्ट्रेशन हो तो इसलिए चेस रेडियोलॉजी इज क्वाइट सेंसिटिव इन पैकिंग एबनॉर्मेलिटीज बट इट इज स्पेसिफिसिटी अपार्ट फ्रॉम फ्यू आंट मेनी डायग्नोसिस इसलिए ऑन टॉप ऑफ दैट वी आर डीलिंग विथ अ डिजीज विच डज नॉट हैव एफिकेंट साइंटिफिक अंडरस्टैंडिंग एंड इट इज डेवलपिंग एवरी डे तो किसी भी टेस्ट को आइडेंटिफाई करने के लिए कि उसकी एक्चुअल कैपेसिटी है एक्यूरेसी क्या है यू हैव टू हैव अ गोल्ड स्टैंडर्ड टू कंपेयर इट विथ और हमारे पास सिचुएशन ये है कि गोल्ड स्टैंडर्ड को इस वक्त मुतन नहीं हो सका फॉर इमेजिंग एंड इवन फॉर अदर टेस्ट दूसरी इंपॉर्टेंट चीज ये है कि जब भी आप कोई टेस्ट करते हैं चाहे वो रेडियोलॉजी हो चाहे बायोकेमिस्ट्री हो देर इज समथिंग कॉल्ड प्री टेस्ट प्रोबेबिलिटी यानी कि उस वक्त डिजीज की प्रेवलेंस कितनी है और जो पेशेंट प्रेजेंट कर रहा है आपको उसकी क्लिनिकल सस्पेशन कितना दिस इज गॉट सिग्निफिकेंट बेयरिंग ऑन हाउ एक्यूरेट सी यू नो हाउ एक्यूरेट द टेस्ट विल बी एंड इट्स पॉजिटिव एंड नेगेटिव प्रिडिक्टिव वैल्यूज चेस्ट इमेजिंग जो है वो कोविड 19 के पेशेंट्स में इट कैन बी यूज इन डायग्नोसिस इट कैन बी यूज इन द असेसमेंट ऑफ सीवियरिटी एंड इन सम पेशेंट्स कैन आल्सो बी यूज टू आइडेंटिफाई दोस पेशेंट्स हु विल बिकम अनवेल इन द नेक्स्ट फ्यू डेज तो पहले हम डिस्कस कर लेते हैं चेस्ट एक्सरे आई एम गोइंग टू बी क्वाइट ब्रीफ इन गोइंग थ्रू द indications because we are going to discuss some individual patients so i don't want to replicate the information symptomatic patients mein uh, chest x ray is not indicated uski wajah ye hai ki the reported sensitivity in these types of patient who are not exhibiting any symptom is between 20 to 25% uh, aur ye bhi us situation mein ki jis waqt pandemic is surging in, in a population so it's not a really good test to to be used in asymptomatic patient however those patient who are presenting to the hospital with symptoms they are unwell and they have got a high pre test probability and particularly in an environment jahan par aapke paas bahut sari cheez nahi hai usme chest x ray is definitely the modality of choice ct ka jo evidence hai wo bahut conflicting hai uski wajah ye hai ki jitni studies aur i can assure you that is coming out right left and center लेकिन जो भी स्टडीज आ रही हैं उसमें कॉन्फ्लिक्टिंग एविडेंस इसलिए है कि चाइना से जो स्टडीज हैं दे यूज सीटी इन ऑलमोस्ट एवरी पेशेंट हु वाज इन द हॉस्पिटल दे हैड अ वेरी वेरी तो इस वजह से उनका जो सीटी का एविडेंस अगर आप देखें उनके पेपर्स में तो इट इज वेरी डिफरेंट फ्रॉम वॉट इज वॉटेड फ्रॉम एल्सवेयर फॉर एग्जाम्पल इन यूरोप वेयर दे है बीन मच मोर रिलेक्टेंट इन यूजिंग सी टी एज एन एज अडेलिटी identifying and certainly prognostifying patient with uh, covid-19 main aapko do ek sab example de raha hu this is this is probably the most quoted study which came out in february in radiology uh, it has around 1000 patients and they identified uh, again from china wuhan and the sensitivity was quoted as 97% लेकिन अगर आप इस स्टडी को थोड़ा सा भी पढ़े तो उसमें ये अंदाजा होगा कि दे वर कंपेयरिंग इट विद आरटी पीसीआर uh gold standard was not entirely and they were comparing it with uh, multiple uh, times when rt pcr so some of the time it was done after two or three negative attempts that it was unke uh, patients ki jo zyada tar thi wo sick patients the aur usme jo interval tha symptoms and presentation ka wo bahut kam tha zyada tar patients ko hospital mein image kiya gaya tha that may basically makes the results a little bit more difficult to analyze on the contrary agar ye ek study jo thi wo ki gayi thi un patient ek cruise ship thi jisme obviously a lot of people were infected and they were docked and they all some of them were imaged usme jo jo heran ki baat thi wo ye thi ki jo asymptomatic patients the unme around 54% mein abnormal ct tha which is quite alarming lekin it's also important to remember that Uh, 46% did not have any abnormality on CT, so it was really 50% which you will miss if you use CT in asymptomatic patients. It was unsurprising that asymptomatic patient may nearly 80% had an abnormal CT. So, the guidance available is 
has i i must admit quite a, 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 a variety of you know uh, suggestions by various learned societies to hame dekhna hai ki pakistan mein hum kis tarike se is cheez ko implement kar sakte hain main do aapko iski variations present kar deta hu ek to jo hai wo fresh society hai fresh society is quite keen on using ct as an imaging tool बट नन दस के पेशेंट जिनमें माइल्ड सिम्टम्स हैं और जिनमें सस्पेक्टेड कोविड है उसमें इमेजिंग उस वक्त तक इंडिकेटेड नहीं है जब तक आपको ये हंड्रेड परसेंट अंदाजा ना हो कि दिस इज गोइंग टू एक्चुअली चेंज मैनेज इस सोसाइटी गाइडलाइंस ये कहती हैं कि अगर वर्सनिंग रेस्पिरेटरी स्टेटस है देन यू शुड कंसिडर इमेजिंग एंड मोस्ट ऑफ द टाइम दे वुड लाइक टू डू सी टी the american college of radiology and certainly the royal college of radiology are both not particularly keen on uh, promoting ct use because uski various reasons hain usme jo sabse important hai wo availability aur logistics hai as you would know ke ek patient ko agar hum ct pe uh, karte hain to you will it will take a lot of time for the ct machine to be decontaminated it will take out uh, you know at least 30 to 40 minutes and if the volume of patients are high then we really have to make sure that we are using ct in patients who absolutely needed and not for everybody else because then we will be constrained by the availability of resources or agar aisi situation hogi to fir we may end up in a situation where uh, the we may compromise on uh, decontamination and that can obviously cause problem in the hospital environment because there will be cross infection दूसरी रीजन वाई ए सी आर एंड आर सी आर प्लेन फिल्म रेडियोलॉजी कैन बी डिप्लॉइड इन अ मोबाइल इन्वायरमेंट इसको डी कंटेमिनेट करना आसान होता है सी टी ऑब्वियसली कैन नॉट बी डन एज स्मूथली थोड़ी सी कुछ साइड देर आर बिट मोर बिजी सो आई अपोलोजाइज फॉर दिस लेकिन अब जहां तक हम आते हैं किन पेशेंट्स को रेडियोलॉजी मैं यू नो मैनेज कैसे करना है ओवरऑल इन हॉस्पिटल एनवायरनमेंट एंड वेयर डज इमेजिंग सिट्स इन दिस मैनेजमेंट एल्गोरिथम तो ये एनएचएस इंग्लैंड और द ब्रिटिश सोसाइटी ऑफ फॉरेंसिक इमेजिंग ने दिस इज अ टूल व्हिच दे हैव एग्रीड कि अगर कोई सस्पेक्टेड कोविड-19 प्रेजेंट करता है पेशेंट तो उसको कैसे आप इमेज uh, करेंगे किस तरीके से उसको असेस करेंगे और क्या तरीके कार होगा डिपेंडिंग ऑन द रिजल्ट So if you can see, um, you've got uh, immediately. You have to, you know, obviously goes without saying that you will assess them clinically. You will do lab investigations. If they are seriously ill, then you know the main stay of initial imaging is the chest X-ray. Because if you find abnormality on a chest X-ray, a CT is not going to give you any further information other than if you are concerned about some specific pathology. फॉर एग्जाम्पल पमरी एम्बोलोजम वो पेशेंट जिसमें फीवर नहीं है और लिम्फोपीनिया नहीं है बिकॉज बोथ ऑफ देम आर हाईली स्पेसिफिक फॉर कोविड नाइनटीन दे कैन बी कंसिडर्ड एज लेस लाइकली और उसमें आप डिस्कशन हो सकती है कि एक्चुअली वेदर यू नीड एमेजिंग एट ऑल ऑन जहां तक इसके बाद का ताल्लुक है कि सिवियरली हिल पेशेंट्स हैं अगर तो वो डिटेरिएट कर रहे हैं या उसमें कोई और डायग्नोसिस सस्पेक्टेड है देन वी कैन गो ऑन एंड डू अ अगर नहीं है तो सीरियल रेडियोग्राफ्स कैन सर्व द पर्पस एब्सोल्युटली फाइन अच्छा एक सवाल जो बहुत कॉमनली जब पैंडेमिक हो रहा होता है जाहिर सी बात है कि पेशेंट हर तरह के हॉस्पिटल में आते हैं दे विल बी पेशेंट हु विल रिक्वायर सर्जरी तो इन द लास्ट थ्री मंथ्स दिस गाइडेंस हैज चेंज ऑलमोस्ट लाइक एवरी मंथ के मैनेज दीज पेशेंट्स इनिशियली द प्रॉब्लम इन एनवायरमेंट वाज वी वर नॉट एबल टू डिप्लॉय enough testing capacity so we were not able to demonstrate uh, you know do rt pcr in every patient who required within a short period of time so us waqt there was guidance ke agar patient ko urgent surgery ki zarurat hai which cannot be delayed then they may be considered having a ct to identify any involvement uh, of covid 19 which has not yet declared itself by the way of symptoms lekin ab सिचुएशन ये है कि क्योंकि हमारे पास अवेलेबिलिटी है आर टी पी सी आर की एंड पीपल आर गेटिंग टेस्टेड वेरी क्विकली देर फॉर दिस गाइडेंस एज चेंज और सी टी इज ओनली रिक्वायर्ड इफ द सर्जरी इज टू बी परफॉर्म एज एन एमरजेंसी एंड वी डो नॉट हैव टाइम फॉर दी आर टी पी सी आर टू कम बैक 
तो रूटीन सर्जरी में सीटी थोरेक्स के फिलहाल जो है वो गाइडेंस नहीं है बट दिस ऑब्वियसली वेरीज कि आपके एनवायरनमेंट यू नो लोकल रिसोर्सेज क्या हैं अगर लोकल रिसोर्सेज में आर टी पी सी आर अवेलेबिलिटी नहीं है देन सी टी कैन बी कंसिडर्ड इन रिस्क स्ट्रेटिफाइंग क्योंकि अगर तो थिएटर इज इट्स हाईली यू नो रिस्क एनवायरमेंट फॉर डिसमिनेटिंग डिजीज तो सी टी कैन बी कंसिडर्ड इन दिस पेशेंट दूसरा एक सीनारी है विच इज कॉमन विद इन द हॉस्पिटल एनवायरमेंट के पेशेंट का नेगेटिव कोविड नाइनटीन आर टी पी सी आर है बट देर इज एविडेंस clinically that the patient has got uh, uh, covid 19 so usme bhi ye algorithm this is this was developed by the royal free hospital uh, i'm not going to go through all the details of this uh, but this is available i'll put uh, these references uh, on the impacts uh, facebook page uh, along with this presentation so in the next uh, couple of hours so that if somebody wants to look at it they can have a look लेकिन इसमें जो मेन चीज है वो ये थी इट ऑल डिपेंड्स ऑन हाउ क्लिनिकल यू नो सस्पेशन यू आर अगर एब नॉर्मल चेस्ट एक्सरे है और आपके पास क्लिनिकल सस्पेशन है या एब नॉर्मल सी है और आपके पास क्लिनिकल सस्पेशन है तो फिर आइसोलेशन को खत्म नहीं किया जा सकता बिकॉज ये हमें पता है कि कुछ पेशेंट में इनिशियल आर टी पी सी आर नेगेटिव होते हैं on i have come across several examples where we have reported a chest x ray is highly suspicious of covid 19 but the rt pcr is negative i remember a case recently uh, of in fact a hospital colleague who was in itu jisme ke rt pcr teen dafa negative tha and finally on bronchial alveolar lavage when he was admitted in intensive care it became positive however the chest x ray was abnormal in most of these things so अगर आपका चेस्ट एक्सरे आर नॉर्मल है तो टेक होम मैसेज ऑफ दिस स्लाइड इज अगर एम नॉर्मल है और हाई क्लिनिकल सस्पेशन है अनफॉर्चुनेटली यू कैन नॉट डी आइसोलेट दैम सो वी आर गो थ्रू वेरी क्विकली ऑन सम पैटर्न विच यू विल एक्सपेक्ट विद कोविड नाइनटीन गो थ्रू सम चेस्ट एक्सरे पैटर्न वी विल गो थ्रू सम सी टी पैटर्न वी टच बेस ऑन समल इमेजिंग but i will not be going into details of pediatric or neuroradiology because it's sort of outside my area of uh, practice um again i'm not going to i'm not aiming to make anybody a radiologist or turn somebody who is already an excellent radiologist into something better but this is just uh, to give you a flavor and it's always it's always good to look at some images after having boring you all with such a long talk if you look at uh, how covid 19 present this is just a typical example you know you will see the patient presents initially between 5 to 8 10 days <clears throat> with bilateral infiltrate so the main thing is if you can see the arrow um, <clears throat> is the presence of infiltrate which are predominantly towards the periphery of the lungs so there is some sparing of the central part of the of the lungs <clears throat> amjit can you confirm can you see my arrow okay इट्स नॉट अनकॉमन कि आप जब पुराने जब प्रोग्रेशन देखते हैं तो पीपल यूजली प्रोग्रेसिव बिटवीन डे एट टू डे फिफ्टीन एंड दिस इज यूजली वॉट हैपन एंड अप विद एन एनजी ट्यूब एंड एन इंटेंसिव केयर इन्वायरमेंट एंड द ओपेसिटी बिकम्स वेरी वाइड स्प्रेड दिस इज अगेन एन एग्जाम्पल ऑफ समबडी यू प्रेजेंटेड ऑन डे फोर इज गोट वेरिटिवली लिटल इन द वे ऑफ ओपेसिफिकेशन अपार्ट फ्रॉम सम पेरिफरल ओपेसिफिकेशन हेयर but then on day 6 quickly progressing towards uh, you know ongoing infiltration and then becoming much more pronounced on day 11 but again if you notice it is more peripheral kyunki chest x ray widely available hai this is a paper which came out recently and it's a very good paper particularly in the context of uh, uh, some more resource constrained environment like pakistan jahan par हमारे पास चेस्ट एक्सरे प्रॉब्लम ज्यादा अवेलेबल है कंपेयर टू सीटी एक मकसद आपकी इमेजिंग करने का ये होता है कि आप वो पेशेंट्स को आइडेंटिफाई करें हु आर गोइंग टू बिकम अनवेल बिकॉज यू विल ट्राई टू मैनेज देम एक्सपेक्टेडली तो फॉर एग्जांपल इफ यू कम अप विद एन एल्गोरिथम व्हिच विल टेल यू व्हिच पेशेंट्स विल डिटेरियोरेट यू मे बी इन अ बेटर पोजीशन टू एडवाइज पेशेंट्स रिलेटिव्स टू बी अवेयर दिस इज पॉसिबल 
uh, be aware that they may need hospital admission or in fact intensive care and therefore given that uh, in some instances ke centralized koi nizam nahi hai ke immediately identify ho ke intensive care bed ki availability ka hai these kind of tools can help uh, both the doctors and the patients <coughs> and their relatives to um, to plan ahead basically so this is a paper again i'll put the reference in um, inhone jo hai they divided uh, the chest x ray into six different quadrants and they defined a, a chest x ray severity score and the bottom line of this paper was that if you've got a severity score of greater than 3 then your chances of requiring oxygen and progressing on to intensive care environment was significantly high so this was an important study uh, again i'm not going to go through how this score was calculated i, I will provide a reference uh, people who are reporting radiographs or people who are routinely looking at radiographs can look into it and perhaps uh, use it in their normal uh, radiological practice kisi bhi patient mein jisme ventilation ho and visible ventilation obviously you will be aware there are side effects and one of the side effects is that the patient may uh, exhibit uh, air where it should not be this is just an example of severe subcutaneous emphysema in an intubated patient jo um, you can also see there is a a, a pneumomediastinum so just to be aware of the various complications दूसरी जो इम्पोर्टेंट थिंग है वो ये है कि इन पेशेंट्स में यू नो लाइंस और एनजी ट्यूब्स और इस तरह की जो है सारी इंटरवेंशन होती हैं एंड दैट नीड्स टू बी वेरीफाइड विद रेडियोलॉजी सो ऑल दो वी आर ऑलवेज फोकस्ड ऑन लुकिंग एट द लंग वी शुड नॉट फोगेट अबाउट लुकिंग एट अदर थिंग्स इन द फिल्म सो फॉर एग्जाम्पल ऑन दिस फिल्म देर इज एन एन जी ट्यूब विच इज एक्चुअली सिटिंग इन द लेफ्ट मेन ब्रॉन्कस फॉलोइंग दर्ट ऑफ द ब्रॉन्कस राइट टू द लेफ्ट मिडल सॉरी लेफ्ट लोअर लो So this needs to be removed and replaced. As we Dr. Raat was saying in the presentation, we discussed it. It is not uncommon for these patients, and I will touch base upon it again when we discuss about CT. These patients may have pulmonary embolus. Uh, now, I would like to draw your attention to what is eponymously called a, a you know, a reduced attenuation. तो अगर किसी को सिग्निफिकेंट पल्मोनरी एम्बुलिक डिजीज है व्हाट कैन हैपन इज और दिस इज नॉट एन एग्जांपल ऑफ कोविड आई कुड नॉट फाइंड एन एग्जांपल ऑफ कोविड 19 इन दिस कॉन्टेक्स्ट व्हाट आई डिड वांट टू ड्रॉ अटेंशन के आपको पता है कि कोविड 19 में दे विल बी बायोलैटरल इन्फिल्ट्रेट्स अगर पेशेंट डिटीरियोरेट हुआ है क्लिनिकली और नहीं समझ में आ रहा कि क्यों डिटीरियोरेट हुआ है और एक्सरे पे एक्चुअली लग रहा है कि शायद यू नो थिंग्स आर इंप्रूविंग दैट मे बी अ फॉल्स रीअश्योरेंस बिकॉज Usually, when there is a large pulmonary embolus, you will find that the vascularity of the lung field is reduced, and in fact, that may mimic uh, incorrectly that the patient is improving. Because remember, the main manifestation of COVID-19 on a radiograph is infiltrative changes, and, and you know that can be uh, mixed with vascular changes. So, it's really necessary that if you feel that there is reduced vascular it's difficult it's not easy uh, but uh, something to bear in mind uh, and if you are suspicious and there are indication that there may be an a coagulative process then uh, please consider doing a ct so we are now going to move on to the ct patterns of covid <coughs> um there are some established uh, evidence now after 3 or 4 months of repeated uh, uh, papers coming out so uh, jo ct ki manifestation and these can be uh, sort of characterized in three different ways one which is called classic and most likely or probable second is indeterminate i we are not entirely sure that is in fact this is covid and uh, the last one is which is very very unlikely to represent covid so again i'll give some examples but it is quite clear that the main uh, way of how covid manifests itself is that it produces bilateral and basal predominant uh, uh, opacification which can be ground glass it can be like crazy paving and i'll show you some examples 
there may be peripheral consolidation and there may be perilobular infiltration indeterminate changes mein agar central aapko opacification ya ground glass density hai aur agar unilateral hai then it is you have to be a little bit suspicious non covid is lobar pneumonia uh, pre in bud appearances the pre in bud appearances for radiology uh, personnel is as you know is something which is manifested in um, um, airways disease this is not entirely usually an airways disease so this is not usually seen with uh, with covid 19 cavitation is also have not been reported lymphadenopathy and pleural effusion are also very uncommon and if present should raise a, a different diagnosis yahan par ek zaruri cheez jo main kehna chahunga wo hai ct technique aapko pata hai ke there are various way of imaging the thorax by ct you can do an unenhanced ct which is called or or an hr ct or dusra tarika hai which you can do a ct pa or contrast enhance jo cheez main dikhana chahta hu ye hai ke dono mein जो फर्क है जो बुनियादी फर्क है वो ये है कि जो आपका सी टी पी है फ्री ब्रेथ होल्ड यू डो नॉट आज द पेशेंट टू टेक अ डीप इंस्पायरेशन एंड होल्ड देयर ब्रेथ बिकॉज दैट पुश इज कॉन्ट्रास्ट आउट ऑफ द पलमनरी वेस्कुलेचर सो यू आज देम टू स्टॉप ब्रीदिंग वेर एवर दे आर कम्फर्टेबल सो दैट इज अलाइट प्रॉब्लम बिकॉज वॉट यू वॉन्ट इज फुली इंस्पायर्ड लंग सो दैट यू कैन असेस दी पेरेंट टाइम अप्रोप्रेटली तो ये एक ही पेशेंट है इस पेशेंट में लेफ्ट साइड पे जो मैं ये सर्कल कर रहा हूँ ये आपका नॉन कॉन्ट्रास्ट सीटी था और ये कॉन्ट्रास्ट नॉन सीटी था इस पेशेंट में आप देखें तो जो ओपेसिफिकेशन है इट इज मच मोर प्रोनाउंस्ड एट द सेम लेवल ऑन द सी टी पी ए और उसका रीजन ये है कि द पेशेंट इज नॉट इन डीप इंस्पिरेशन एंड दैट कैन ऑगमेंट द अमाउंट ऑफ ओपेसिफिकेशन एंड कैन कॉज फॉल्स you know um, severity index in these patients so usually better ye hota hai ke agar aapke paas is tarah ka patient hai so you do two uh, exposures one is uh, with full inspiration or agar patient actually is able to prone themselves and that is the best way of imaging their chest and then you can do a ctpa after you've done a non contrast study this is another example jo aapke left side pe hai वो आपका नॉन कॉन्ट्रास्ट इन्हांस लेकिन जो है फुल इंस्पिरेशन में था ये जो है वो इस कॉन्ट्रास्ट इन्हांस दोनों में सिर्फ फर्क जो है वो इंस्पिरेशन के लेवल का है एंड यू कैन सी दैट दिस पेशेंट व्हिच इज नॉट इन इंस्पिरेशन अपीयर्स टू बी मच मोर द लंग्स अपीयर टू बी मच मोर इन मोर देन दे एक्चुअली आर सो इट इज इम्पोर्टेंट टू मेक श्योर कि इंडियन पेशेंट में कोविड नाइन्टीन सस्पेक्टेड है उनकी जो इमेजिंग है दिस शुड बी टेलर टू द नीड अब क्योंकि सी की रिलायबिलिटी के बारे में कोई इन्फॉर्मेशन हतमी कायम नहीं हो सकी है इसलिए सम पीपल हैव कम अप विद सम स्कोर्स टू मेक श्योर के इवन विद इन अ डिपार्टमेंट जो है वो जब रिपोर्टिंग हो सी की तो इट इज रिप्रोड्यूसेबल एंड रिफरिंग डॉक्टर्स आर एबल टू अंडरस्टैंड कि एक्चुअली रिपोर्ट में वो क्या क्या है बिकॉज इट इज क्वाइट ईजी के अगर uh indeterminate findings and then the, the results can be uh, not particularly helpful for the referring clinician so i'm not a particular fan of performer reporting but like in this situation i think it is reasonable ke uh, jo hai wo isko adopt kiya jaye and sim- simply because um it is important to make our reports uniform uh, and as reproducible as possible uh so this is a correct again this is a paper in radiology which came out in march and the authors identified ke uh, there are various you know mainly one to five um, which can uh, you know the a ct report can be characterized depending on the uh, likelihood of covid uh, being the, uh, the, the 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 cause of the finding and again not going into too much detail lekin like usme uh, kuch findings hain which will make the patient much more likely uh, to be considered uh, uh, corad 1 to which is quite low versus corad 5 which is considered high likelihood of uh, again it is slightly outside the remit to go through the paper completely but i will put it on for people who would like to adopt this way of reporting so that they can review this 
so i've taken the liberty of uh, uh, using um, uh, some examples from this chinese paper because they had such a large number of patients it was quite easy to look at a collage uh, uh, of various patients quite quickly and again it's a very similar theme these are three different patients uh, on your left uh, these are their uh, presentation cts and given that there was such a a freely available ct bonanza they got ct sort of four or five times actually in their admission certainly something which cannot be advocated in every uh, healthcare environment but anyways it just provides us with some pictorial examples as you can see over the theme continues that you will have ground glass opacity these opacities will enlarge then they will become a bit more confluent and then they will become more uh, uh, more conspicuous and more consolidated over the course of the illness dusri uh, hai wo you know you can get infiltrative changes along the the lobules or the um, um, i'll show you an example in fact i'll come back to it in a minute as you know ke lungs are made up of multiple secondary nodule so this is basically lung is a combination of or a, or a, or a conglomerate of most of the you know the these nodules which comprises of lymphatics vessels acni and then they've got this boundary in which there is further lymphatics and vessels running so one of the ways uh, of uh, covid 19 to present is that it provide you know it causes infiltrative changes along these lobules and this can be seen particularly in a or in a in a sub pleural uh, distribution in addition to the ground glass opacity which we obviously know very well now <clears throat> crazy paving is a eponymous name uh, it basically mean that uh, you can see just about i'm trying to point out with my arrow the boundaries of these secondary nodules become because they are infiltrated and then within the nodule these are down glass changes and you can you can just about see ke jaise koi farash hai uh, and then this is basically why it is called crazy crazy paving and this is quite a strong indicator <coughs> of covid 19 <coughs> again these are examples of crazy paving in different patients there are some more confluent changes slightly odd in this patient because we all know that the uh, this covid 19 presents more in the posterior aspects of the lower lobes but nevertheless as we have learned that this is a master of disguise so it can present in any way shape or form <clears throat> very interesting uh, observation <clears throat> in some of the patients a there is vascular engorgement or some of the vessels towards the periphery become prominent more prominent than they should be this is one example you can see in the left upper lobe there is quite prominent um, uh, vessels in the periphery and there are surrounding ground glass changes you won't find this big vessel in the periphery of the lung in a usual uh, ct <clears throat> this is again an example in fact this is an example where i can see normal versus abnormal vessels so in the left upper lobe you can see quite an engorged vessel in fact in the in the left lower lobe we will see a more normal side vessel so why does this happen uski jo hai kuch theories hain i think i'm just going to touch on it towards the end of the ct discussion where we are going to discuss uh, the um, embolic phenomenon and the endothelial inflammatory phenomenon <clears throat> another uh, manifestation is a reverse halo sign uh, again so fancy way of saying that there is central um, less uh, ground glass and there, there is surrounding areas of uh, more significant involvement i will be honest this is a very non specific sign lekin agar uh, the the mantra of discussion is it all depends how much prevalence there is in your uh, community when you image somebody with a ct because if the prevalence is high the pre test probability and the positive predictive value automatically becomes very high so in an environment where there is low uh, community presence this may well not be covid but if there is a, a surge in the community then this should be considered covid 
<laughs> as rahat has touched upon there are patient who will have uh, embolic phenomenon and uh, thrombotic events in patient with covid 19 Uh, this was a study published in may actually um, it's quite a nice nice study because it identifies quite unique areas which were not previously discussed aur usme jo main cheez thi wo ye thi ki there was quite a high proportion of these patients so around 22% who who developed a pulmonary embolus so the, the, these are patient who are covid 19 rt pcr positive um, admitted into the hospital and was suspicious of having an embolus and out of these 22% in fact were found to have positive p this is quite a high hit rate uh, for a pulmonary embolus um, in this population interesting the risk factors were obesity and the prior history uh, of having dvt or p and the reduced risk was with statins and we know that statins have anti inflammatory properties um and that may contribute towards reduced risk of endothelial inflammation and in turn that may cause a reduced risk of pulmonary event but i guess the most uh, uh, surprising thing was that this did not actually meant that the patient are going to do bad in you know so in fact nearly 70% of these patients actually did not require um, you know it admission and one of the reasons could be that because p was identified the anticoagulation was judicious and and particularly well done and they this may actually have led to improve outcome but i don't have any way of confirming this again it was a retrospective studies uh, because of the fact that we are in the middle of a pandemic so we have to take it with a pinch of salt but nevertheless quite the uh, an important So very quickly coming back to why the vessels can be engorged the reason could be that while you know ctpa can pick up filling defects when there is endothelial inflammation and potentially developing micro throm from by uh, and in congestion it manifests itself as uh, engorged vessels or prominent vessels in the areas of lung which are involved <coughs> this is a stock image of uh, pulmonary embolus sitting in main pulmonary artery uh yeah the findings are not uncommon in covid uh, because there is uh, quite a significant proportion of people presenting with abdominal uh, symptoms and the main stay of these findings is if you look at uh, upper quadrant pain it is predominantly due to polystasis cholestasis which can be confirmed with ultrasound or uh, जिसमें जिन पेशेंट में ज्यादा सर्जिकल एब्डोमेन है उसमें इट इज यूजली रिलेटेड टू स्केमिक बाउल एंड अगेन इट इज क्वाइट क्लियर दैट दिस इज द मैनिफेस्टेशन ऑफ ऑफ पोटेंशियल एम्बोलिक और फ्रॉम फ्रॉम बोजेनिक फिनोमेन एंड इंटेंसिव केयर एनवायरनमेंट में अगर पेशेंट को कोई एब्डोमिनल फीचर्स हैं इट इज इम्पोर्टेंट टू मेक श्योर दैट दे आर इमेज क्विकली बिकॉज um usually these uh, patient can deteriorate quite uh, quickly uh, with regards to ischemic bowel this is uh, an example from a paper uh, which identified what can be expected in uh, abdominal imaging and i mean to be fair it's not sort of any ground breaking uh, images but it shows that there is usually thickening of the bowel uh, again driven mainly by potential embolic or thrombogenic uh, phenomenon developing there can be mesenteric congestion as identified in this particular area along the mesenteric border of this patient and be aware of uh, findings uh, which are incidental so this is an abdominal it's a sort of blown up radiograph uh, in which there is air within the portal venous circulation uh, which presents uh, obviously quite significant ischemia um there may be nematosis within the bowel and again this is an example of a ct showing uh, here with the portal venous tract one thing to be beware of this is should not be a complete preclusion for uh, surgical uh, candidature because we know that in some of these patients uh, we have picked up nematosis actually without having florid uh, ischemic bowel just going to touch very briefly 
while you are uh, imaging covid covid and covid and aapke sabke awason pe sab covid hi sawar hai to jo dusre patient hai wo bhi ghayab nahi ho gaye hain to unki imaging bhi ho rahi hai aur unme se kuch patient aise honge ke jin pe diagnose nahi hua hai so it is important to discuss with your radiograph uh, radiographers and your colleagues or support staff to give them a brief idea of what to expect if some you know they come up with a give them some example this is an example this patient had an mrcp unexpectedly they were uh, you know that jab hum mrcp karte hain to the lung bases are involved it's important ke jo mrcp kar rahe hain unko thoda sa pata ho ya even ct kar rahe hain abdomen ka routinely they keep a look out for these incidental findings so that agar ye identify ho jati hain so at least we can try and make sure that the patient does not uh, transmit unknowingly within the hospital there is emerging data and i'm not going to go to too much detail it's not my forte so there is pediatric data uh, and there is neurological data neurology is predominantly again driven by uh, vascular complications so hemorrhagic necrotizing encephalopathy and joint encephalitis are the two manifestations on mri which has been repeatedly described in the last few weeks रेडियोलॉजी मेक शो दैट in your hospital environment there is a consensus on how where and when we are going to image patients kis tarike se we are going to make sure that we are appropriately selecting the patients who are likely to be covid and going to covid hot areas versus patients who are unlikely to be covid and are going to areas which are deemed safe uh, or covid free chest x ray again pakistan ke tarazon mein should be the mainstay of imaging and i think that is being correctly practiced currently um koi bhi imaging ya koi bhi test kabhi bhi aapko 100% specificity nahi de sakta aur zaruri hai ki kisi bhi test ko final uski interpretation se pehle kam se kam itna batao ki prevalence aur clinical details kya ct definitely has a role uh, lekin it is a limited role um, it can should not be used to identify patients who are asymptomatic or in fact identify asymptomatic disease in patients who are visiting hospital or are attendants with patients looking after patients in a hospital environment because you are going to miss 50% so better yahi hai ki agar is tarah ki zarurat pesh aaye to you have to rely on an rt pcr agar wo available hai ki only in extreme situation so the cd should be used with the no knowledge that it can miss quite a significant number kadaria intubated patients aapke paas imaging ke liye agar aate hain cd department mein then it's best to avoid imaging them unless there is a definite indication so you have to be judicious in selecting these patients usme jo cheeze important hain aapko pata hai ki hamare radiology departments are pretty much within the depths of the hospital because of radiation protection और वेंटिलेशन uh, जो है वो इतनी ज्यादा अवेलेबल यूजली नहीं होती है नेगेटिव प्रेशर रूम्स नहीं होते हैं दीजा ये है कि पेशेंट को ऐसा पहुंच जाता है कि जो कि एरोसलाइज uh, करता है ड्रॉपलेट्स को वायरस के विद इन अ सीटी फॉर एग्जांपल इन अ सीटी रूम और इवन इन अल्ट्रासाउंड रूम और चेस्ट रूम एक्सरे रूम दैट एरोसलाइज कंटेंट ऑफ वायरस विल रिमेन देयर फॉर अ प्रोटेक्टेड पीरियड ऑफ टाइम और ये बहुत जरूरी है कि एक तो उसको अवॉइड किया जाए और अगर ये होता है तो उसको मैनेज किया जाए उससे बेहतर ये है कि ज्यादातर जो इस तरह के पेशेंट्स हैं वो आर इंट्यूबेटेड और ऑन नॉन इन्वेजिव वेंटिलेशन शुड बी इमेज विद इन दी इंटेंसिव केयर और वार्ड एनवायरनमेंट बाय मोबाइल वीडियोग्राफी अगर पेशेंट सी के लिए आते हैं तो उनके लिए जरूरी है कि इस बात का ख्याल रखा जाए कि अगर तो सर्किट पूरा मेनटेन है उनका तो इट इज नॉट गोइंग टू प्रोड्यूस एनी एरोसोल लेकिन ये बहुत जरूरी है कि अगर एरोसोल अगर सर्किट ब्रेक हो गया यानी कि कोई ट्यूब डिस्लॉज हो गई है उसको दोबारा करना पड़ा विद इन द सिटी रूम देन यू हैव टू मेक श्योर दैट यू हैव गॉट सम रिस्क असेसमेंट कि कितनी देर तक जो है वो कमरा नहीं इस्तेमाल करना चाहिए किस तरीके से उसको प्रॉपर वेंटिलेशन होनी चाहिए 
इसी इसी जिम में जो है वो सेंट्रलाइज एयर कंडीशनिंग कैन एक्चुअली कॉज प्रॉब्लम अवेयर कि कोई भी ऐसी इन्वायरमेंट जहाँ पर एरोसोल जनरेशन पॉसिबल है दैट शुड नॉट बी कनेक्टेड वाया सेंट्रलाइज एयर कंडीशनिंग टू एरियाज फॉर एग्जाम्पल रिपोर्टिंग एरियाज और अदर कोविड एरिया इट इज अ गुड आइडिया टू बी ऑर्गेनाइज एवरी टाइम यू नो लेकिन इस वक्त और भी जरूरी है क्योंकि अगर आपके सिटी रूम में कुछ बहुत सारी चीजें पड़ी हुई हैं तो इट्स इट्स वेरी इम्पोर्टेंट डिफिकल्ट टू क्लीन दम अप्रोप्रिएट टू ट्राई एंड मेक श्योर कि आपके जो रिपोर्टिंग एरिया है आपके जो रूम्स हैं उसमें एज मच एज पॉसिबल चीजें हटा दी जाए ताकि उनको क्लीनिंग करने में जो है कम से कम टाइम हो और डाउन टाइम इज रिड्यूस पेशेंट में सिटी करते वक्त इस बात का ख्याल रखें कि अगर सिटी पी ए कर रहे हैं तो यू गेट ए सिटी थॉरेक्स अगर पॉसिबल है इन अ प्रोन पोजिशन लेकिन अगर पॉसिबल नहीं है तो एटलीस्ट इन फुल इंस्पिरेशन इन सुपाइन पोजिशन एंड यू विल सी द डिफरेंस विथ योर ओन आईज हाउ इट मे लुक मोर सीवियर ऑन सी टी पी ए ऑल दो इट इज नॉट इसी तरीके से अगर सी टी एबडोमिन हो रहा है किसी पेशेंट में तो वी नो दैट यूज प्रपोर्शन ऑफ पेशेंट गॉट सी टी फाइंडिंग विल हैव द फाइंडिंग इन द बेस ऑफ दबडोमिन सॉरी द बेस ऑफ द लंग और द लोअर लोब तो इट इज गुड प्रैक्टिस विदाउट एनी फाइनेंशियल इम्प्लीकेशन प्लीज कवर अप टू द हाईला यू विल ऑलमोस्ट सर्टनली आइडेंटिफाई मोस्ट ऑफ द पेशेंट हु आर इंसिडेंटल Uh, harboring covid and that can actually change uh, significant and you can make sure ke aapke jo surgical colleagues hain they are shielded from this uh, asymptomatic spread again train the support staff to help you out in picking up incidental findings uh, interventional radiology obviously it's a theater environment so appropriate personal protective equipment is required as per you know hospital guidelines lekin kuch cheeze aisi hain ki jo usually कभी कभी आप बेड साइड भी कर देते हैं तो इसलिए मैंने उसको मेंशन कर दिया है कि एनजी ट्यूब और एनजी ट्यूब प्लेसमेंट बिकॉज यू आर सो क्लोज टू दी पेशेंट्स अपर एरो डाइजेस्टिव फैट इट इज इम्पोर्टेंट टू कीप दिस इज माइंड दिस इज एन एरोसोल जनरेटिंग प्रोसीजर सो यू हैव टू मेक श्योर दैट यू आर यूजिंग एन एफ एफ पी थ्री मास्क और विद कम्प्लीट सील इफ यू आर डूइंग दीज टाइप ऑफ प्रोसीजर इवन इफ इट मीन दैट के ये वार्ड बेस्ड ही बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया आई एम सॉरी दैट आई हैव टेकन क्वाइट सम टाइम बट आई होप दैट आई हैव कवर्ड मोस्ट ऑफ योर इंफॉर्मेशन एंड आई एम वेरी हैप्पी टू आंसर एनी क्वेश्चन if somebody wants to ask question i you can either i'll just wait for uh, dr anjit to resume back yes. better position um and then he thank will you questions thank you everybody for listening that was a very useful talk with not only with regards to radiological findings uh, to look out for on uh, in covid-19 patients but also a significant amount of the presentation was based around safety of radiological and medical staff in uh, in procedures management handling air conditioning and position of radiology departments in the uh, ground and basement floors of the hospitals where the risk is higher uh, i'd like to start taking some questions so first uh, question from uh, dr razima can i also uh, can i also ask uh, everybody who is going to ask questions to uh, uh, tell a bit about themselves uh, uh, in what capacity do they work dr uh, sayed Ma razima ahmed please assalam alaikum uh, i am professor sayed razima mohammad and i'm the principal of mohammad medical college meerpur khas which is located in one of the uh, relatively smaller cities of sin uh, it's a very nice presentation actually and uh, you just uh, what i liked was that you just uh, kept it uh, you know jitna tha utna hi aapne bataya ki radiology ka itna role hai and you didn't try to enhance the role you know like people of most specialty do when they talk about their own specialty तो ये बहुत अच्छी तरह से हम लोगों को समझ में आ गया कि चेस्ट एक्सरे और सीटी जो है उसको कब इस्तेमाल करें और किस तरह इस्तेमाल करें 
आई पर्टिकुलर लाइट के जो इंसिडेंटल फाइंडिंग्स के बारे में आपने बताया कि जो ये बातें हैं कि इसमें जिसमें एन जी ट्यूब जो है वो कभी लंग में चली गई या एक इंसिडेंटल फाइंडिंग कोविड नाइन्टीन के साइंस की आगे चेस्ट एक्सरे में तो उसको स्क्रीन uh, करके और उसको बचाया जाए दूसरों को उससे कैसे बचाया बचाया जाए हाउ ऑफन इट इज दैट वेन यू डू द chest x-ray or ct scan in this environment that you come across these incidental fighting is it quite often or it is a rare happening ji bahut shukriya thank you very much for your kind comments dekhiye isme kyunki it was in the last 3 months the prevalence in the uk was changing the peak tha april ke shuru mein tha us waqt situation ye thi ke jaise trauma ct hua hai usme ओकेजनली हमें मिल जाती थी फीलिंग्स रिलेटेड टू कोविड सर्जिकल पेशेंट्स में वो फाइंडिंग इट वेरी कॉमन टू फाइंड कोविड 19 इन द बेस ऑफ द लंग द इंसिडेंस इज प्रीडोमिनेंटली ड्रिवन बाय द फैक्ट कि उस वक्त कम्युनिटी में प्रेवलेंस कितनी ज्यादा है इसी तरीके से अगर आप भी समझ लें कि कराची वर्सेस इंटीरियर सिन अगर कराची में आप इसको देखेंगे तो द प्रेवलेंस ऑफ इंसिडेंटल फाइंडिंग इज लाइकली टू बी वेरी हाई एज कम्पेयर टू दी इंटीरियर सिंध वहाँ पर इस वक्त क्योंकि पीक शायद नहीं आई है तो देर फॉर देंसिटिविटी जो है किसी भी रेडियोग्राफर की या रेडियोलॉजिस्ट की शुड बी ड्रिवन बाई दी इन्वायरमेंट प्रैक्टिसिंग और वो फिर जरूरी यही है कि जो विद इन द हॉस्पिटल आपके दूसरे कोलीग्स हैं विद इन द हॉस्पिटल यू नीड टू अंडरस्टैंड कि उनसे आपका रेगुलर जो है वो मुकालमा होता रहे क्योंकि हमारे लिए क्योंकि रेडियोलॉजी इज जो सबसे इम्पोर्टेंट चीज सारे कोलीग्स के लिए वही है कि रेडियोलॉजी कभी भी इस इन्वायरमेंट में खास तौर पे जो है वो बंद कमरे में प्रैक्टिस करनी नहीं चाहिए उसकी वजह ये है कि यू विल बी ऑब्वियस टू व्हाट इज गोइंग ऑन इन द हॉस्पिटल तो हमने ये कोशिश करी है कि पहले से ज्यादा जो है कोलीग्स के साथ या तो ग्रैंड राउंड हो या फिर कोलीग्स के साथ एम हो ताकि कम अज कम इतना पता चले या इवन कॉरिडोर टॉक या इवन टेली कॉन्फ्रेंस आपको पता हो कि आपके पास इस वक्त जो पेशेंट्स आ रहे हैं उनकी क्या सिचुएशन है कोविड कितने आ रहे हैं कितनी ज्यादा इसमें आ रहे हैं तो मेरी गुजारिश यही है कि शुड बी ड्रिवन बाय द इंसिडेंस ऑफ व्हाट यू आर एक्सपीरियंसिंग विद इन द कम्युनिटी एंड दैट शुड बी ड्रिवन बाय द यू नो कांस्टेंट डायलॉग विद योर कोलीग्स थैंक यू नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन प्लीज हेलो हेलो हियर मी यस वी कैन हियर यू बी करम्स जी जी और एक्चुअली वी वांटेड टू बी मेक ए गाइडलाइन एंड फ्लो चार्ट हाउ टू मैनेज द पेशेंट इन द इन द पाकिस्तान यू नो इन पाकिस्तान इन पेरिफेरी इन प्राइमरी हेल्थ केयर इवन एक्सरे टेस्ट इज हार्डली अवेलेबल एंड देयर इज सीबीसी एंड दीस थिंग्स आर अवेलेबल and pcr is not available at every corner in mean, in whole of the sindh excluding karachi our lab is performing the pcr of the patients and people they are going to collect the sample from the remote area they are sending us the ato then we are making uh, we are we are uh, doing the pcr in our diagnostic research lab uh, daily basis more than 2000 pcr but you know the number of the patient is high so i think uh, in periphery if you if you will help us to make a guideline to treat the patient uh, of the covid of the line pain in pakistan uh, suppose a, a general practitioner or primary physician who sitting in bhu uh, he should advise the cbc and in cbc there is a lymphopenia and other findings then he should have a x ray test and then he should uh, ask the patient because every patient there are many uh, just like a common flu just like a usually patient having a Uh, the now there is now the season is coming for the dengue fever there is also typhoid fever is common in our country so it's very difficult to to move every patient towards the tertiary care hospital so it will be lot of the burden on the tertiary care hospital we will, we will not be able to manage so please can you help us in making you you are the pakistani people you know the condition of the pakistan in our hospital which is tertiary care hospital we have got a ct scan and machine so too but these are away from the icu so uh, how to so we can uh, and we have a lot of the burden of other patients so this is very difficult to uh, have a ct scan of these patients so hardly we can have a photo blood test x ray in the icu 
So we are doing this, we are doing this practice over here, and we are trying to uh, ask the government because we are requesting the government to put uh, keep the CT scan inserted in the near the ICU in that same building. But it will take time, and we have got a lot of the patients daily. We are very much worried, and every day uh, because people did initially in the province of Sindh there was very good lockdown. And uh, initially, the Kaftan people, the uh, other people, they have been very well isolated and quarantined, and all becomes uh, uh, healthy. But unfortunately, after that, people, uh, other person, other people, they have not followed the SOP. And now, uh, I think, uh, in my opinion, I think uh, more than uh, more than 25, 30 percent population of the Pakistan is uh, almost infected with the COVID virus. And uh, many of the asymptomatic, they are uh, uh, they are they are spreading the infection. And even our doctors, they are very we we, we are disease is new for everyone. And we are afraid of uh, this disease. And many people they they don't want to work. I many especially the young doctors having little knowledge. And uh, although government is providing the PPE, we are doing all the things. But please, so we should make uh, some flow chart. Starting from a village towards the tertiary care hospital, how to open and how we will move this patient. We need this. Otherwise, we cannot bear the burden. You know, in Karachi, every hospital is full of the every ICU, every hospital is full of the COVID virus. In our hospital in the city grounds, all the beds are full. In Damsaro, we have a plan for 200 beds and another. So, this is uh, for the indoor of these patients having the symptoms. We are not uh, keeping the patient asymptomatic, and we are uh, keeping them at, uh, at their home, their house, uh, at their home, or home quarantine or home isolation. But unfortunately, these patients are not following those. And uh, if one patient is in family having this problem, then other uh, other family all will be infected. All are going to be infected within a couple of the days. So this is really a great challenge. Help us in making the guidelines. In very valid, uh, very valid, and I can appreciate and I salute everybody who's working in Pakistan currently in this environment. With regards to the the, the difficulties and the practical difficulties and how um, uh, you know, a, a flowchart can be maintained, I think that is an important, you know, uh, and it has to be done at the level of the Department of Health with collaboration. Uh, with an you know uh, organization like the impact and we will be more than happy to contribute to uh, making sure that there is a, a simplified flow chart uh, particularly catering people who are in the uh, sort of rural areas where there is no immediate availability especially care environment so with regards to radiology i would like to say that as i have identified Imaging is not required for any everybody with this disease. You know, you can use other markers, including the full blood count, the clinical uh, presentation, to appropriately advise a vast majority of these patients. The problem arises when, unfortunately, people would utilize imaging inappropriately, and therefore the provision of imaging then becomes more difficult for people who are actually required to undergo these imaging procedures. So, as you said, it is absolutely imperative and I would uh, request uh, the organization and anybody who is currently on the forum who would like to contribute to come together and from the radiology side and you know I know all my other colleagues who are part of this or impact organization we will be more than happy to contribute to providing a simplistic flowchart which will help uh, any uniform uh, you know management uh, in the interior patients inshallah Questions, anybody? Any more questions? No more questions for now, Dr. Najib Ahmed. If you've got any further questions, we would ask you to please uh, write it on our Facebook page where it's gone live uh, with your credentials as well if possible. And we'd like you to uh, uh, share as widely as possible. This was a very useful session with a lot of clinical information and safety information for Pakistan. Uh, and we hope to improve our services further uh, in the future coming uh, sessions by Impact Team. Thank you very much again, and Allah Hafiz. Uh,
Just before we go, don't forget to fill in the feedback forms if you can, which uh, have been attached to invites. Uh, we'd really appreciate uh, some feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Allah. Allah.